moment, I'm going to ask for the folks at the table to introduce themselves. But before that, Mayor DC, a few words. Thank you. Yeah, I just really appreciate everyone but being here for this important discussion and being here for the full afternoon. We've got a full house this afternoon compared to this morning. Um, uh, I will need to recuse myself from this decision, but I did bring the gavel for vice mayor here uh, to help close out the session. And just know that is multi-purpose. So if Jim gets out of hand, you know. <laughs> but thank you all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And it sounds like someone's coming through virtually somehow. Uh, probably someone just needs to be muted. That's what happens. So, um, so great. Would you want to start us off just to take a moment? And he's going to model how to do this well, right? He's going to say <laughs> his name. He's going to say his role and his entity. And then he's going to say what within one word, one aspect that he's excited about in terms of this project. Can you do it? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Clifton. I serve as your city manager. The one thing I'm excited about is community. Thank you. I stole my word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Christina Ruwakaba. I am with the city attorney's office and I work with community development and planning that's here today as well as engineering. Um, and I guess my word, since I can't have community, would be excitement. I'm excited. I'm Regina Salas. Uh, serving on council for three years and nine months. And my word for the week is synergy. Hi, I'm Austin Aslan on council. I've been on council apparently for three years, nine months. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my word is emerging tech. That's one word. <laughs> Miranda Sweet, I serve as vice mayor and my word is knowledge. I'm Jim McCarthy. I'm in my sixth year on yeah, city council. And my echo oh, I mean, my word is information. My name is Whitney Cunningham. I'm an attorney here at Flagstaff with Aspie Watkins and Diesel. I work for Northern Arizona Healthcare on this project. And my word is solutions. Uh, Steve Ice, I'm the vice president of construction and real estate development for Northern Arizona Healthcare. And my word is clarity. My name is Michelle McNulty. I'm the planning director for the city of Flagstaff, and my word is direction. My name is Tiffany Antall. I'm the zoning code manager for the city of Flagstaff, and my word is finish line. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Fantastic. <laughs> and I'm going to venture to say that every single one of you agrees with every single everybody else's word. Yes. Thank you. Thank Council you. Member Council member Shimoni, please. Thank you, City Manager and Julie. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, Adam Schmoni, City Council Member, and my word is wellness. Fantastic. Great. So we've got community excitement, synergy, emerging technology, information, solution, clarity, direction, finish line, and wellness. I don't wellness. remember it. <laughs> sure I won't. Great. So to start us off, I want to make sure that anybody who is speaking, um, if you're at the table, should be fine because there are mics here. But if for some reason, some folks from the peanut gallery, just kidding, <laughs> you're not the peanut gallery, but if some folks from, from over here would like to speak, we're going to ask for you to run up here, maybe have a seat at the table or maybe come to the podium so that folks who are joining us remotely also can hear. So questions, comments before we get started? Great. So we would like to start off with a staff summary of the timeline to date um, and the process and having some salient talking points. If you have questions, please feel free to scribble them down and we'll ask um, whoever's presenting to then, of course, open it up when the time is right from whoever's presenting um, to share this. I also want to make sure that you feel like the pace is allowing for people to ask questions or to share, that you're not doing the quick, let me say my point, let me quick say my point, so that there's some breathing room so that people can jump in 
and really have a have a dynamic conversation. So with that, who are we presenting to? Wonderful. Can we give our hand? Uh, Tiffany Antal, Zoning Code Manager. Um, this is a lot different than normally. I'm just at council and I just get to see council and everybody else is in the background. So this is a lot different where I can see everybody's faces. So good luck. Um, <laughs> so first thing I wanted to go through today was the project history. Um, just giving you an understanding of, of the time that staff has been working on this project. Um, as you can see here, um, we had a pre-application meeting with the NAH team back in July of 2019. Um, this is not the first time we heard about the hospital project. Certainly there were discussions that had started earlier in that year, uh, but we did have that formal pre-application meeting, uh, met, discussed, talked about opportunities, directions that we might pursue in regards to the application. From there, um, you know, time went by, we picked up the conversation again in early 2020 um, and then started really getting into conversations late in 2020. So from September to December of 2020, we were having ongoing conversations about what applications would need to occur in order to move this application forward. Um, Lots of different options were discussed, um, and I'll walk through briefly what we've decided was best route. Uh, in January of 2021, uh, the traffic impact analysis pre-scoping documentation, and if you have questions about what pre-scoping is, we have our lovely transportation team in the back that can answer any of these detailed questions. So we started pre-scoping. Um, there were some big changes that were going to happen to the regional road network to accommodate this project. We, uh, once we received that pre-scoping, we wanted to take some steps back, make sure we were getting it right, we, because it would be a huge mistake if we didn't get it right and NAH had moved forward with designs uh, with the road network that we didn't think was going to work. Um, from there, we started meeting regularly with NAH um, until their official application was submitted in April of 2021. So I'm just going to talk really quickly about the entitlement process. There's a lot of things that as staff we kind of mumble about, but every application goes through a two-step review. We talk about what is administratively complete, and then we talk about a substantive review. Um, every application that we see goes through these two different processes. So first up, administrative complete means you've checked all of the boxes on the application. Staff has everything that they need in order to start that substantive or what is those that real review. So once we receive that application in April of 2021, our first set of incomplete comments were then routed through our interdivisional staff review team, or IDS, as I'll call for short, um, were delivered the next month in May. Um, it took us about five rounds of comments and resubmittals to get that application administratively complete. That application, all of these applications that we're gonna talk about, were deemed administratively complete on February 25th of 2022. Um, so you can see that took a substantial amount of time, but there were a lot of documents that needed to be provided, a lot of impact analysis, a lot of things that go beyond the scope of what a regular rezoning case would require. In terms of substantive review, we did start that review on February 25th. Um, so what I can say is that this application has been in that substantive review. This is when staff is making the, this needs to go here and where, not just that we're missing this piece of information for about seven months. And that is a shared timeline between the city and um, NAH. So when um, the city has the application, we're working on it, we're then returning it for, for corrections or comments, it's going back out to NAH, they're taking their time with it. So part of that seven months is in a back and forth form. So these are the development applications that have been submitted to date for Northern Arizona Healthcare. Uh, we have a minor regional plan amendment 
we have a specific plan, we have a concept zoning map amendment, and we have a development agreement. I group those and title them the entitlement applications because it's just easier to say than reading off all of those different titles. In addition, we are also reviewed, we've also already reviewed a concept plan for the hospital itself because this is a much larger project than just the hospital. Uh, we've also reviewed a concept plat for how this larger acreage will be divided into sub parcels. Um, and we've also started the review of a site plan uh, for the hospital specifically and the ambulatory surgical center together. That site plan right now is all in administrative review. So I just want to give you the lowdown on what each of these applications do. So the minor regional plan amendment, there are four pieces to this. Uh, we need to amend maps to change the area type within a future suburban activity center from neighborhood scale to regional scale. This hospital um, facility, the Northern Arizona Healthcare Village is anticipated to be a regional attraction. Um, and so it is important that the activity center that serves this area matches that designation. We would also be amending maps 21, 22, and 24 by moving the center point of the future suburban activity center. The location of the activity center of where it is now is at what was intended to be a future road intersection um, and was aligned with what was a previous development considered many years ago. Uh, so this would take the heart of that activity center and place it right over where the hospital is located. And then amend map 21 to designate area within the south of the activity center as an employment area, which is great news. Um, usually we're fighting and losing at employment areas within the regional plan, but this would be one of the places that we gain um, employment area. And then lastly, um, and this is probably the big one, which is to amend map 25 to realign a future circulation road corridor, um, specifically Beulah. So at the top of this map, what you're seeing is what is exists today in the regional plan. And that would have called for Beulah Boulevard to have moved away from its current alignment um, and move further to the west. Uh, and then closer to Fort Tuthill, basically along its border, and then coming back and, and connecting with the John Wesley Powell Corridor. Um, the reason why this alignment was there is because, as you can see, there's a dotted dash orange line that goes underneath I-17. Um, there is a future in our regional plan map, there is a future underpass proposed here um, at this location. It was thought at the time that the regional plan was developed that the alignment needed to be pushed further back in order to make the grades work to allow Beulah or to allow for this road connection under I-17. We've been working with the applicant to show that leaving Beulah in place can still work with this proposed intersection. However, it will be important to note that that intersection when built will be depressed from its existing location. So it'll move down in terms of grade to accommodate a future underpass. So the specific plan, a specific plan is, and I can't even read that from as far away, but a specific <laughs> plan is a detailed element of the general plan that provides a greater level of detail for a specific geographic area. The specific plan on other things controls the location of buildings and other improvements with respect to existing and planned rights of way floodplains, public utilities, use of land, buildings and structures, the height and bulk of buildings and structures and the open space around building and structures. So this proposed specific plan makes modifications to the following sections of the Flagstaff City Code. It's going to alter building placement standards for some very specific reasons. The hospital needs to be set back further from I-17. There is a significant noise issue um, because this is a care facility, a place where people are seeking respite. Um, there are certain constraints in terms of noise. Uh, for architectural standards, um, the hospital will be a very large, unique building, and they're looking to be able to treat this building um, according to those specific standards. There are a few little revised landscaping standards. Bicycle parking, don't worry, it's only an increase. It's not a decrease to bicycle parking. 
Um, parking spaces, parking lots, design, the layout is a very minor change to a parking garage. Um, some changes to our definitions to make sure that uses are properly called out for. Um, and I would, I guess I left out potentially building height. That's the big one. Oh, so the development use and form tables um, uh, for specific uses of well, as well as building placement and building form requirements, which is building height. So one of the pretty significant requests that comes out of this specific plan is for an increased building height on one particular piece of the entire health care village. And that's for a building height of 160 feet that exceeds the maximum allowed building height in the city of Flagstaff and any, under any zoning category by 100 feet. And lastly, we've got a concept zoning map amendment. So this zoning map amendment is for 172.6 acres in total. Um, right now, the property is zoned a combination of rural residential, estate residential, and a tiny little sliver of single family residential. It would all be rezoned to highway commercial, which is the primary category at 109.7 acres. Research and development, about 27.8 acres, and public facilities, 35.2 acres. I would note that that public facility zone is being applied to an open space parcel. Um, public facilities allows more active recreation than our open space zoning category, and that's the reason why public facilities is chosen here. So, we have been working on this case for a, a, a while now, um, and we've gotten to a point where we still have some outstanding issues, um, places where we need to overcome, get direction, um, things we need to resolve in order to, I'm trying to use all your keywords, in order to move forward. So these um, big outstanding issues, and I'll apologize, there's two additional I kind of am going to throw in here um, and we can discuss at your will. Uh, but the first is transportation impact analysis and mitigation. Um, this is a big one. It's a big project. Uh, the roadway design for the proposed development, the service of transit to the site, and fire service. I would like to add that of those other two outstanding issues, we building height is is it, it's an outstanding issue. It's it's um, the building is a uh, proposed or the building height is proposed at 160 feet, but I would note that the building is not actually as proposed 160 feet. So right now we're looking, and I have site plan documents that you don't have in front of you, and we don't have as part of the entitlement applications, but that site plan really shows that the building is about at its tallest, 142 feet. And that includes a portion of the building that is the elevator penthouse. When we look at zoning, it's hard to say, normally we don't count the elevator penthouse. There are parts of elevator and stairwell bulkheads that we don't normally count in terms of building heights. They're normal uh, disturbance above a regular building uh, roof level. Um, so what I can tell you is, is it's hard to say, we generally allow those elevator bulk heights to go about 15 feet above what that normal height would be, but no matter what, we're gonna be over that height. So that 142 feet is to the highest top of an elevator penthouse, which is the smallest portion of a, of a large building. And then the bulk of the building itself, which is really the sort of the residential tower of the hospital is about at 112 feet. And then the parking garage just for um, association is at approximately about 65 feet. So with that, the other outstanding issue I would also mention, um, and I don't have a lot to, to say on that issue, is the location of the existing hospital um, and what will occur with that site. Um, there has been conversations about including language in the development agreement for this current entitlement project, um, and there are ongoing efforts. Um, Michelle McNulty is here and she's an expert on what's going on with the existing hospital site. Um, I'm kind of trying to work, focus my attention on this site. So we haven't spent as much time um, on the existing site and what will happen there, but we've got the resources to be able to answer any questions that should come up. So we're going to move on to the significant outstanding issues. First one is going to be the transportation impact analysis. Our transportation team is here. That's 
um, Jeff Bauman and Stephanie Santana. Um, they helped prepare these slides. They didn't want to run up here, so I'm going to do this for them. Uh, outstanding items that still need to be addressed include a segment analysis for the internal re regional roadways. I'll break that down for you. What a segment analysis helps us determine is what the size of the road needs to be. Does it need to be two lanes? Does it need to be four lanes? A roundabout analysis for internal inter intersections. We're only looking at the places where there would be a potential for single lane roundabouts. We are not looking at the potential for dual lane roundabouts. The airport TI intersection and bridge um, and mitigated config configurations. Um, so we all know that ADOT is looking at replacing the intersection bridge coming up very soon. They're looking at replacing it with only a two lane bridge. Um, it really will likely need to be a four lane bridge, if not now, very shortly in the future, if this project were to move forward. Um, so we're looking at all possible avenues, but there are existing roundabouts that serve that particular bridge and how those uh, roundabouts might need to be mitigated and how they can fit in existing right of ways at existing locations. Um, also, regional roadway intersection spacing analysis. So, and this and this has to do with roadway intersections um, at, located on site. And I have a map that I'll try to show what I'm talking about. And then off-site mitigation strategies. Um, so, on any development case, there are on-site mitigation and off-site mitigation strategies. So, this is still one of the outstanding items that we need to come to conclusion on. And just as a note, the county has, uh, Coconino County has requested that there be a special event scenario analysis. Um, this was not a request we documented it as part of the final TIA scoping document, um, but it has, it has been an ongoing request by Coconino County um, to see some of this work completed. So let's talk about roadway designs. This map might be a little small for you, but there are four primary roads within the project boundary. Eula Boulevard is the big one. Um, and this looks at improving full of Eula, Eula, Eula Boulevard through its entire extent um, from Lake Mary Road out to the project location and beyond. Um, Eula is a minor arterial. It is a four lane uh, roadway. Um, because Beulah is on one side with I-17, we are looking at approving a rural lane section on that side. No curb gutter sidewalk on the side closest to I-17, as there are no particular properties that access that location. Uh, of course, bike lanes and, of course, a multimodal path on the alternative side. Healthcare Boulevard is the smallest leg of these roadways that you see. It's on the northern boundary of the property, but on this map, the way you're looking at it, north is that way. Um, so, healthcare is also minor arterial intended. Uh, yeah, oh, it's this way. I'm looking at it backward. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, healthcare boulevard is also a minor arterial designed to have four lanes as well, uh, multimodal paths on both sides, no on street bike lanes. Um, healthcare boulevard will be a roadway that it eventually extends and connects with Woody Mountain Road. So it is another large arterial um, road connection that will eventually be made at Flagstaff. Um, lastly, you have Purple Sage, which is an existing road now, will be relocated from and improved, obviously, from its existing. It is a collector level roadway, along with Wellness Loop, which is sort of the loop of, along the backside. Um, which is also a collector roadway. What you'll see missing here is there's a, a missing connection link where the triangle doesn't close. Um, and that is off of the Northern Arizona property site. Uh, this has been one of the continuing conversations between staff and the applicant. Right now, um, the, the planning documents have included roundabouts at the end of healthcare and at the end of wellness loop. Um, staff would still urge that these roadways be completed or that we reach some kind of agreement as utilities also need to be extended in these corridors, corridor, at least within one corridor, and setting those utilities right in conjunction with what will be a future roadway bed will be extremely important um, to not place an, an additional burden on an adjacent developer as they should move forward. Um, 
And uh, lastly, I was going to talk about the intersections. So what you don't see, what doesn't show well on this map are, of course, there are signalized intersections proposed at where both Purple Sage and Healthcare Boulevard connect with Beulah Boulevard. But internal to the site, there are signalized intersections proposed at the entrances um, for the hospital. Um, and so that is basically on Healthcare Boulevard and Purple Sage. There are concerns that those intersections are too close. We're still working through those details. Um, roundabouts may be a resolution or maybe a possibility to solve some of those proximity issues. That's one of the outstanding issues um, that needs to be resolved. And proposed transportation mitigation. This focuses on the prioritization of impacts contiguous to the subject, so in terms of the development agreement and what NIH has proposed to us today, the proposed transportation mitigation is looking at focusing on prioritization of impacts contiguous to the subject area over other areas in the city that um, proposes to complete improvements to Beulah Boulevard prior to occupancy of the hospital or ambulatory surgical facility. Um, and that NIH will su support the city um, with future grant funding opportunities, um, and that NIH will complete a second TIA after initial basis of occupancy. This is all based off of a current internal draft development agreement, um, but this is what is essentially proposed as mitigation uh, in terms of the traffic impact analysis to date. Uh, transit has been one of the uh, common themes in regards to this project. I Today, in terms of the development agreement, the applicant does propose to provide transit service with the development of the hospital and ambulatory surgical center. The development agreement calls out that transit service will include paratransit service, no cost transportation for ambulatory discharge patients, and either point-to-point -point transportation service or access to public transportation. Um, but that is the bulk of the details that have been provided. Um, to date, that's what we have. Uh, fire service uh, is another area of issue. The project represents significant increases to the city's fire protection and service delivery demands. Essentially, we're taking what is an urban facility today and moving it further out from our urban core, um, an area where we had not anticipated maybe the expansion or intensity of use, but also the increase in building height. Um, an enhancement to current capabilities are necessary to support the rezoning of the property. And it mutually agreed, uh, both NAH and the city of Flagstaff have mutually agreed to work through a standards of cover analysis for the city of Flagstaff, which should provide a risk analysis of needed service levels and a gap analysis of what is missing. Um, this survey or this particular analysis is outstanding. Um, and if we wait to receive this level of information, we will push past the deadline for which NAH would like to move this application forward. I just want to throw out here just really quickly. I'm almost done, I promise. I'm hoping you're going to come stand next to me. Please just push me off. Uh, additional, there have been additional staff suggestions. When I reference the interdivision staff team, there are a whole large group of us. Um, there are some of us that are louder than others or feel or seem more important than others. But I don't want my other partners to seem they're not as important or their comments or concerns have, have been disregarded in any way. Um, our sustainability team, our parks and rec team um, have all made comments in regards to this process and we are hoping to be able to achieve lots with this project. So one of the things that we've tried to focus on is transportation demand management program. Um, these are things that have not been codified. These are things that we're working out and getting as policies adopted that we hope to have codified in the future. And this is one of those great opportunities. You're moving a major employer from the center of town in Flagstaff out to the the outskirts. I mean, this is a great opportunity for NAH to move forward with encouraging active modes of transportation. We know that most patients will not be using these active modes of transportation when visiting this hospital. There are a lot of staff that work here. Um, there are a lot of administrator workers. There are a lot of people who can use alternative modes, maybe not the ER doctor. We get that. Um, but we still think it's important that um, transportation demand management be included um, 
in this project. Uh, also, the climate emergency and carbon neutrality. We work really hard with all of our applicants on all projects to try to include um, provisions that support the climate emergency as well as our carbon neutrality plan. To date, NIH has committed to best efforts in implementing sustainability features. Um, they've created a, a sustainability plan that includes lots of really great options. There isn't an official commitment to any of those. Um, so that's where we are to date. Um, can I use this opportunity to make a suggestion for an addition on that last bullet point there? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is dark sky compliance. Um, I Rick recently explained to me that NEH is, has its eye on the ball on that, um, which is great. Uh, I think we should put this in here as part of any mutual agreement we come to and, and specifically I want to make sure at the end of the day that our Naval Observatory um, signs off on this project, both for the, the redevelopment and uh, whatever we do with the old space. That's a good point. I hadn't been thinking about it in terms of the redevelopment, so thank you. Um, definitely, we've met with the Naval Observatory on this project. Um, staff's biggest concern to date has been with the height of the building and the increase and what, because it's outside of the norm and what our codes would manage, and so we are trying to work with the applicant. I imagine there's going to be a lot of uh, window curtains open at night, and that's hard to control and, and account for uh, at the beginning of the process. But uh, some education techniques can go in there, maybe some rules about how the interior of the building is are lit, things like that. Yeah, we, we think we can come to a, a mutual agreement on that and think that we can control it through automated processes. And I promise this is my last slide. Um, so next up is the housing emergency. So we early, early on, because this is an activity center, we pushed hard to get some housing within this activity center. Um, and NAH has definitely reciprocated. They have included approximately 315 market rate residential units as part of the mixed use development. Um, this does come in an early phase, so this is great. Um, there are no affordable housing incentives being utilized, um, so there is no commitment to those affordable housing standards within the zoning code. And then lastly, parks. Um, park, the parks and recreation, this is a tough one. Parks and recreation master plan identifies a need for active recreation facilities in this area. I know you're asking if it took me this right next to Port Tile, which is a very large regional park, and uh, we don't disagree. But that master plan is looking for active recreation that is not actually found in that regional park. Um, this development is including a park like amenity um, and we are working to encourage NAH to include some active recreational amenities. Um, our last uh, review included items where there are small workout stations, you know, along the foot trail uh, at Buffalo Park, you see those those workout stations amenities. We're looking to see something like that. Um, and we're excited that that eventually I think we're going to get there. I'm just going to be real out. I'll stay optimistic. I, I agree with you. OK, there we go. And then. I am I'm good with what I have for you all and the experts are here in the room. I, I didn't mean to this step with the fire chief. He is here too. He didn't want to jump up and join me in the conversation, but everybody's here for questions. <laughs> uh -huh. So before you go, can we first give a hand? Now, um, let me open this up. Do we want to have questions right now, or do we want to transition to NAH sharing their talking points and their information, and then do questions and comments after that? That's what I would recommend. Yes? I have a question now, but if you want me to, I'll wait. Thank you. That counts number one, Carthy. My goodness. Let's hold up. Let's hold off then. Is that okay? <laughs> I think you can make a, make a note. <laughs> Wonderful. So, NAH, yeah. come on down. Thank you. Can we give a hand to Steve? So far away from the TV, I hope I can't be able to read. 
you know, this. Um, there's some stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll get there. So th thank you again, Steve Eitz, Vice President of Construction and Real Estate Development for NIH. Thank you, Tiffany. I thought you did a very good job of concisely kind of putting that together. No, you didn't go too fast. Um, it didn't go too slow. So appreciate it. Um, and, and do think that we are kind of nearing a stage where we are really getting on the same page here. Um, so if you remember, my word was clarity from before, and that's really what we're trying to bring to the process. So we're gonna start. Um, we're gonna start. Yeah, we're gonna start a little bit today, just talking, just kind of reminding everybody in the room, reminding everyone from the community um, who might be listening, just a reminder of kind of who NIH is, what we what we do, what we provide. Um, so for more than 50 years, Northern Arizona Healthcare has had an unwavering commitment to better serve patients, healthcare providers, and the community. So most of you know us as. Flagstaff Medical Center or the hospital up on the hill, or there's a couple other nicknames I've heard since I joined the company last year, but we are um, we are a regionally serving um, healthcare system that also has hospitals down in Sedona and Cottonwood and multiple ambulatory buildings kind of throughout the region. Um, we are a we are a nonprofit healthcare system, um, so we are governed by our volunteer board of directors who balance our final decisions with respect for community concerns and needs. Um, so we meet quarterly with our board. That board meeting actually is happened to be ongoing as we speak. So I was at some of the morning meetings this morning, but uh, they are also meeting this afternoon. We also are one of the largest employers in Flagstaff and one of the largest employers in the region. Um, we have an employee base of over 3,000 employees. Um, we would like to see that number even higher, by the way, and then we'll touch on this in a little bit, but we also see not only as a community wellness component to what we plan to deliver, um, we also see this as a great recruitment and retention um, for, for great healthcare providers for the region. Um, as part of our not-for-profit status, um, what that really means, um, we do make a profit. Um, we, all nonprofits have to make a profit in some capacity. Um, but what it means is we take all of our profit, we, we reinvest that revenue back into our company. So there's a couple of forms of what that looks like from a reinvestment perspective. A good bit of our profit gets reinvested into um, wages for our staff. Um, so directly benefiting uh, flag staff and the region by being able to continue to pay um, excellent wages to, to our teams. Um, the rest of that money goes towards capital improvements for our facilities. So that is upgrades to facilities, it's upgrades to medical technology, it's upgrades to equipment, it's us kind of being able to continue to pro provide great health care for the community moving forward. Um, our emergency department is open to all regardless of ability to pay, and I'll touch on that more in a second also, uh, but we, we are a uh, community hospital. Uh, we do not turn patients um, away, so if you come to our ED, we are going to serve you, um, and I'll talk later on in this presentation how we plan on serving you better at our new facility, um, specifically geared towards better wait times in our emergency department. And maybe maybe one of the more important things that we service as as not only for Flagstaff but as a region, we are the only level one trauma facility north of Arizona. I don't think this point can be stressed enough. Um, there are 13 level one trauma centers in the state of Arizona. 11 of them reside in Phoenix proper. One of them is in Tucson. We're the only one north of Phoenix for the entire northern half of the state, southern Utah, western New Mexico. Um, we serve a 50,000 uh, mile radius of patients. So a little bit about how we serve the community. 25% um, of our patients are considered financially disadvantaged. As I said earlier, we don't we don't turn patients away. Um, serving an area of more than 50,000 square miles, um, we are a sole community provider health system in in northern Arizona. And one third of our patients at FMC are enrolled members of Native American tribes. In addition to that. Um, NIH provided more than $125 million in care for patients who would not have been able to afford these services otherwise in FY 2021. So that $125 million number, that was just for our fiscal year 2021, is how much we gave back in uncompensated care from Medicare, Medicaid, um, a mixture of that, community uh, charity care, et cetera. So we consider ourselves a huge benefit to the community, not only from an economical perspective, but from a clinical perspective. A little bit about why we have to leave. Um, I'm sure most everybody in this room has unfortunately probably had to use our services or maybe fortunately in some cases for what we do. Um, but we've really outgrown our home at Flagstaff Medical Center. Um, I think there is some misconceptions in the community that we just decided one day that we needed a better location or wanted a new shiny hospital. It's not really the case. Um, there was quite a bit of due diligence work done in the 2019-2020 timeframe to see what we could do about repurposing the existing hospital. It really, it really just can't be done. It can't be done in an efficient manner. It can't be done in a cost-efficient manner, and it can't be done in a timely, efficient manner. Manner. 
We are currently 25% um, smaller than what a current healthcare facility is in the year 2022. Um, that metric is generally based off of gross uh, square footage of your hospital divided by licensed beds. Um, so modern hospitals right now are somewhere around 2,300 square feet of space for every one licensed bed. That's what gives us the capabilities to serve the community from a surgical perspective, an imaging perspective, lab, pharmacy, and some of the other things that go along with patient care. We sit at 1,693 square feet per bed, so we are woefully undersized. Um, and what you what you'll see in a minute is that kind of <clears throat> that presents itself in multiple fashions, both from a clinical perspective, but also from a back of house perspective, with our ability to grow into future technologies, store equipment properly, um, and have patients have family visitors um, come with them. So this aerial kind of shows how we've stretched. Um, from our west campus over to our east campus, you all know that we have the bridge across Kiever Street um, that has connected our facility. Our inpatient bed units, uh, they span across five different buildings. Um, so any of you who have worked in the healthcare field, um, efficiency is kind of key to not only clinical quality care, but also efficiency from a staffing perspective to run operationally from a financial perspective. We have a very inefficient platform for healthcare. We have kind of cobble together units in five separate locations with very odd staffing ratios. We don't have, um, our rooms aren't the same as you go from unit to unit. Some of them were built in, in different decades. Some of them have certain technologies that other rooms can't accommodate. Healthcare as a business is moving to uh, into an outpatient platform whenever possible, right? It's not only been a demand um, from a patient perspective, but it's been a demand from an insurance and governmental perspective to try and move whatever we can from an inpatient setting to an outpatient setting. Um, so that is the reason you're seeing what we are showing as our ambulatory care center. Um, and, it's, and if you go around the country, you'll see most healthcare systems all over the country that are providing these ambulatory platforms, which are kind of a one-stop shop for outpatient care where you can see primary care providers, specialty care providers, um, ambulatory surgery, imaging, outpatient lab, blood draw, et cetera. We are unable to integrate that ambulatory platform onto our existing campus. We already don't have enough parking on campus. Um, we're hundreds of spots below what our baseline parking should be. Uh, and that's without us growing anything on the campus. So just as we stand right now, we're not able to meet our parking demand. Um, and, and this is maybe the most important bullet point on this slide, uh, the bottom one. In the past year, we have had 5,600 deferrals due to unit capacity, with 55% of those being from facilities on tribal lands. So what that means is every 12 months, or in the last 12 months, we have deferred 5,600 community members to either Phoenix or Las Vegas because we were not able to see them in our facility. And it's not because of acuity. We operate as a very high level tertiary care facility. So it's very rare we have to turn patients away because we don't have the uh, clinical skill set to take care of them. It's more than likely that they got turned away because we don't have the capacity to treat them. So as we start to look at that from a community pr perspective, that's kind of you know 14, 15 patients from our community every day that get sent somewhere else. And it really, if, if you've never been in that boat, it really increases the cost of healthcare, right? You get sent down to Phoenix, you get sent to Vegas. If your family can get up to see you or down to see you, there's increased costs in travel, hotel, et cetera. Yeah. Can you address the COVID factor in that number? Um, I can, um, and actually, it's it's a very it's a very small number decrease. We're actually we we're talking about this this morning because we're seeing the trends dip slightly. Um, but we, because of how Northern Arizona had COVID hit as early on in the process as it did, we saw some of that kind of early on in like I guess that would be the April 2020 timeframe where FMC got inundated from a COVID perspective. But we actually start to, started to see that level out. Um, so this 5,600, um, if we annualized it over years past, is actually pretty close to what our average is. And we see this number only going up in the future, even post-COVID, not going down in the future. So a few more um, just discussions and limitations. Um, you'll see West Campus uh, off to the left there. East Campus, that is our existing campus where our facilities are. Um, it is true that we own the property um, further east um, across San Francisco in that health park. Um, we did look at what we could do to try and build um, a, a health, a new health village uh, over there, including a new inpatient facility and outpatient facility. And it really just takes our problem right now and exacerbates the problem. Um, it takes what is already a, a very horizontal um, hospital and makes it even more horizontal. Um, it continues to kind of 
push our uh, inefficiencies down the road. Um, so that was something that was ruled out in 2019 when the studies were done. This is just a small list of kind of what we're proposing for the existing campus and what our 2019 studies showed what we wouldn't be able to do if we stayed at the existing campus. So we, we would not be able to have a full service um, outpatient surgery center uh, if we repurposed the existing campus, office-based labs, which is another outpatient setting for vascular cardiac labs. Um, we do not have an uh, outpatient imaging center now, and we would not have one in the future. Um, in addition, um, a truly integrated clinic and office building would not be able to uh, function on our campus. Um, one of the other things we're, we're hoping to bring to the community with our new campus is a truly integrated oncology um, center. Right now, we do not have integrated oncology. We have oncology broken up over uh, multiple buildings, and it does not serve our patients as well as we'd like. So a little bit more from a detail perspective about what we're facing today. Um, so this is a slide I've shown a couple of times, and I think it's it's really important and hits home just kind of understand what it's like to be a care provider in our facility and to be a patient in our facility. So that drawing in the middle, um, the, the larger blue portion of that drawing is what is right now today a code minimum ICU room in the state of Arizona. So that is not us um, over designing our rooms. That is exactly what Arizona Department of Health Services would insist that we build at code minimum in order to license um, an ICU bed in Arizona today. That red box that we have drawn over it is a two scale representation of what our intensive care units look like today. So you can see we're considerably undersized um, from an intensive care perspective. And, and this, this image here is really kind of extrapolates itself over the entire campus, but ICU being as highly acute as it is, we thought it was the best representation of what's going on. So that picture to the left, you'll see that is what one of our code teams looks like trying to perform a code on a patient in an ICU room in our existing rooms. Um, you'll notice if you look at the red box with the blue box behind it, we're losing a couple of feet at the top of the room. That couple of feet at the top of the room is where patients, um, families, and friends would stay, which is integral to proper healing. We have no room for, for patients' families to be in the room with them. And as a matter of fact, in, in our ICU department specifically, we no longer even have an ICU waiting room outside of the unit because we've become so inundated with uh, storage needs from a technology perspective that we had to repurpose our waiting room into a storage room. So not only do we not have loved ones being able to be in the room with you, you're not even allowed on the unit anymore. Can you explain better like, like, code? Resuscitation. Yeah, re res resuscitation. Yes. So this is this is you know uh, life saving measures that are taking place um, in our intensive care unit. And then what you'll see um, off to, uh, to the red there also is we're, we're, we're missing a couple of feet um, at the foot of a patient. And what that means from a clinical perspective, and you can see it in this picture, in that particular picture, you see what is the overbed table that's all the way over to the left. That is typically the overbed table for the patient where their food might go um, if they were up and eating. Um, that has to be pushed out of the way. There's nowhere to put supplies and storage in the room, um, and it gives an inability for us to move our patient's beds um, front and back, and so we lose um, access to both the, the head and um, foot of the patient. I'll pause there for a second if anyone has any questions from a clinical perspective. Nope. Okay, so what do we what do we want to do? I mean, you know, on top of what you're going to hear a little bit about economic development, um, growth from a population perspective, emerging technologies from a healthcare perspective, um, at the root of what we really do for a living at, at NAH is we take care of patients. That's our mission is to take care of patients. Clinical excellence is, is our mission. And improving our patient experience is what we think is kind of paramount in our ability to, to get this new development up and running. So you can kind of see that this is not an exact um, replica of what our patient rooms um, will look like, but this is what a more modern, if any of you have been in a hospital built in the last five or seven years, this is what a hospital room looks like in a more modern facility. And it's probably a pretty good representation of what our hospital is, is going to look like. So much larger rooms. Um, full bathrooms in every room. That red box that I showed on the last slide, that was inclusive of the toilet facility that happens to be in those ICU rooms also, which is not really a toilet facility. It's more of a bedpan washing station. They don't actually have bathrooms and showers for our patients in our ICU. Um, and then we'll be able to accommodate um, larger windows and allow for a more natural light in the care setting. 
Um, so there's probably a lot of you that haven't seen this image before. Um, we have been working with our architects, some of which are in the room, on um, what we feel like our facility could look like. Um, you'll see that one portion of the building that kind of runs east-west, um, our bed tower, that was what Tiffany was alluding to earlier, the one portion of the building um, that is quite high. Um, there is uh, clinical purposes behind the height of that building. Um, we know and understand that timeliness and efficiency for patient care is extremely important and that the quickest, most efficient and safest way to serve patients in a hospital setting of this scale um, is vertical transportation and not horizontal transportation. So our existing facility, in some cases, we have patients who are pushed horizontally 900 feet from one side of the building to the other side of the building to get to things like surgery, trauma center, um, and imaging. In, in this particular design, you would see a vertical circulation core that took patients from their rooms down to those uh, services like emergency department services, and surgical services. So um, what we're hoping to provide uh, is expanded clinical options. So that includes uh, comprehensive oncology service, as I said before. So that's infusion treatment, um, med, uh, med onc, surge onc clinic, um, is, uh, along with radiation oncology. Um, we, we are hoping to bring a wound and hyperbaric program to the community. Right now, we do not have a wound and hyperbaric program in Northern Arizona, although it is, uh, we have a high uh, patient population that could use it. Uh, convenient outpatient imaging. Um, so right now, uh, within Flagstep proper, we don't have convenient outpatient imaging. Not only do we not have it, but we don't have a competitor that has it. Um, and then easy access off the I-17 and I-40. So it is worth noting. Uh, that 60% of our patient population at FMC comes from outside of Flagstaff proper. Um, so while there may be some people who live uh, directly adjacent to the existing facility who might look at this and think that it is a burden um, from a transportation perspective to get to our new location for the majority of our patients, um, our, our access off of I-17 and I-40 will actually provide much better ease of access and care. Um, so a couple of things that we did want to show since we showed this image um, that does show some of the scale and significance of our building. Um, as Tiffany mentioned uh, earlier, um, we are proposing that the hospital be back off the street. There's a, multiple reasons, uh, probably the most important of which she already mentioned from a sound attenuation perspective between the I-17 and our facility. Um, but one of our design concepts is to really integrate this entire medical center and ambulatory care center into its forest environment that surrounds it. Um, so we are trying to retain as much of the forest around us as possible. Um, that includes a 22 acre wellness retreat, um, which will be kind of untouched um, land to the west of us. And so when you look at that in actual concept of what this would look like from certain locations around the property, you can see that the hospital in most cases really does disappear. Um, so that larger image to the right is our view from Fort Tuthill from the county park. That's what you would see. These were all done um, using mapping software of actual tree locations, building locations, um, and using um, real locations from a mapping perspective of what of the true conditions. Um, and then um, this is our view from Beulah um, coming in um, at the main hospital entrance. So as you turned onto the campus and, and headed into the um, main entrance, you'll see the majority of the hospital that is kind of further on the south side is actually uh, quite low. Uh, I believe the last number I saw was about 85% of the overall um, footprint of the building is, is smaller than 90 feet. It is a very small percentage of our building where we're looking at increasing the height that is directly related to patient care and patient safety. But you can see it's not nearly as large from a scale perspective at the human scale as it looks when we look at it from an aerial setting up above. Here's another view of it um, from the Sinclair Wash and the Foots Trails. You can see you see very little bit of the um, hospital that just peeks out over the top of the trees there off on the top right. So I was asked right before I started, um, is there anything I could do to decrease wait times in the emergency department? Um, I won't point to who asked me, um, but I was specifically <laughs> asked, um, what can we do? Uh, and I'm, I'm sure this has been a topic of discussion throughout the community. Um, right now, there's not much we can do to decrease the waiting times, um, but it is something that we know is a pain point from a community perspective, and quite honestly, it's a pain point from an NIH perspective, and it's one of the things we intend to be able to fix at our new facility. Um, so for starters, 
Our current plans show an increase of our emergency department from 19,000 square feet to 33,000 square feet. Um, every bit of that 33,000 square feet is single occupancy rooms. So we are all single occupancy on the inpatient side. So ICU, med search beds, all single occupancy. Uh, right now we have 66 double occupancy beds. So if any of you have ever shared a hospital room um, with another patient, it's, it's not a great experience and it's not something you see in modern healthcare any longer. So we are proposing single occupancy rooms for ICU, for med search, for emergency department and observation. Um, we have a very um, efficiently laid out linear track design concepts um, that allows us to be responsive to patient volumes. So that's both from a staffing perspective and a patient perspective. Um, the emergency department uh, it does not stay steady all day. A lot of people think that uh, emergency department volume is sporadic by nature because it's an emergency department. That's actually not true. Um, there is actually a rhythm and a pattern to emergency departments, and there are peaks and valleys to emergency departments. That's not just for us. It's not just for Flagstaff. It's emergency departments across the country. Um, all do have their peaks and valleys, and our current emergency department does not allow us to respond to that from a patient care and staffing perspective. Um, switching to all universal exam and treatment rooms to maximize clinical and operational flexibility. That's not just true in the emergency department. That's true across the entire um, across the entire hospital. Um, so we have committed to a universal room concept so that we can continue to flex um, with the needs of our community as they change in the future, whether acuity goes up or down for our region in the future. Um, the introduction of a low acuity, quick look bay, uh, fast track area to decrease wait times. Um, so that's for our patients that are a little more in and out. Um, right now, our, uh, our biggest problem in getting people out of the waiting room and into um, the emergency department isn't really the emergency department. It's the fact that we don't have enough licensed beds to handle all of our patients. So the emergency department um, backs up because we can't get them out of the emergency department and into the hospital proper. Um, thus, some of the things that lead to our five and a half thousand deferrals a year. Um, so between uh, more efficiently managing the front end of our emergency department and then having a relief valve with more licensed beds on the back end of our emergency department, we feel we can decrease wait times substantially um, and be at or below what national averages are from an emergency department perspective. Um, and then uh, separate areas to support uh, intoxicated patients. Um, as some of you have been in our emergency department, um, we, we do have a high volume of intoxicated patients. And right now we have nowhere to really separate them out. Um, and it does cause trouble specifically with some of our patients on the pediatric side of things. So a little bit about um, where we are kind of considering our aspects uh, of development, um, we really are trying to respectfully integrate ourselves into the natural setting of Fort Tuthill. We feel the property itself is one of the most amazing things we have going for us as we continue to develop healthcare for the region. Um, we have been proactively uh, engaged with traffic, transportation, housing, sustainability, uh, forestry, and numerous other experts and leaders through this 18 months. Um, I think for those of you that are in the room, um, you, you can you can speak to that a little bit, but we have been trying to be as open and transparent with not only the city um, staff, but also the community as a whole. Uh, we've held, and let me I'll touch on this in a second, we've held uh, numerous open houses. We've met with every community group that wanted to meet with us, and um, we have been as transparent as I think you'll see a development team be in our efforts to bring this development to the community. Um, we are specifically working with an advisory council of Native American leaders and a Native American owned architecture firm to make sure that we respectfully integrate their culture into our healing processes. Um, seeking input and guidance to honor traditional healing practices and respect the culture of tribal communities. Um, as I stated earlier, um, over 25% of our patients are from those tribal communities um, and, we, and we take that relationship very seriously. Um, and then a little bit about, um, I know we're not here to talk about the existing campus, we're here to talk about our new campus, but I know I can't get out of a room without at least talking about the existing campus um, for a little bit. So there's some of you in the room who, who are part of this process uh, with us and, and we appreciate that. Um, we have been working um, to establish a redevelopment council with civic and community leaders. Um, uh, we have, uh, we've 
under contract uh, with a group called Puma, who some of you might be familiar with. Puma is an urban management company that the city of Flagstaff and Downtown Business Alliance uh, had actually hired pre-pandemic to look at what the future of downtown Flagstaff could be. Um, we have contracted with them to um, ask them to kind of annex our property. Um, it'll be a whole separate body of work than what the city's doing, but we thought they were um, best served to help us understand what the community needs of a piece of property that is that adjacent to downtown B. Um, so along with Puma's help um, and, our, and our development committee, um, we feel over the next few years that we'll be able to put together what we feel will be um, a very prosperous community development project with the existing campus. So I'll turn it over to Whitney. Let's give a hand for Steve. told me that when the slides start to have words too small to read that he was going to sit down and force me to stand up. I could have, two years ago, I could have read this. Thank you. <laughs> um, so th this is a project. Portable um, program, even better. Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I think we lost sound in the room. Can you give us just a second? Sure. To address that? Thank you. Can you hear us now? Looks like we got muted. It's back. We can yes, we can. Okay. It's can. great. Thank you. Would it be uh, okay to back up just a bit? Adam, I said we were prepared to commit 10% to affordable on the 315 <laughs> <laughs> residential units. And I'm Please to, to repeat that. <laughs> um, there you go. But obviously, that, that's obviously a, a really important part of this. And, and then the clinical partnerships and the research and development opportunities and these types of things that will take place around. It's 170 acres and it's going to be a large project. It deserves a robust public outreach program. And so from the beginning, we have attempted to do that. And what you see on the screen is a list of uh, some of the folks, some of the organizations with whom we have met. Uh, I'm, I'm informed that even today, Senator Sinema has uh, Senator Sinema has signed a letter of support. Arizona Surgeon General uh, Cremona has signed a letter of support indicating the importance of this type of organization regionally, as well as to the city of Flagstaff. Um, we have uh, reached out to every uh, homeowners association around the new project. We've reached out to every homeowners association around the Legacy Campus. We have met with every organization who has asked to meet with us. Uh, many of them more than once. Um, we have mailed letters and will again to over 900 property owners that surround the new project within a half mile radius. Uh, and we've met with them twice via Zoom. We plan to meet with them again uh, via Zoom in a couple of weeks. Um, we, uh, Flagstaff is what, about 70,000? By the time this process will have concluded, we believe that we will have met face-to-face yeah, -face and small meetings and Zoom meetings uh, with over 10% of the entire town. We have uh, drafted a public participation report that will be presented formally to uh, the city before we're done. We currently have over 300 letters of support for this project. We currently have six letters in our possession opposing the project. We have a couple of dozen letters asking serious questions, which is completely appropriate. Uh, but you can see the ratio of support versus opposition. So uh, again, over 300 individuals and community leaders who have spoken out in favor of the project, as well as a number of organizations locally, statewide, uh, that simply recognize kind of the importance to, to underscore some of the things that Steve was talking about, about the need to provide high level quality clinical care to our community. We deserve it and the region needs it. We can't provide it any longer and this is the solution.
economically, this project is going to bring a lot of positive benefits to the region, but specifically also to Flagstaff. Uh, we've hired an economist who's For uh, the region, uh, over 10,000 jobs will be created. A, 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 a majority of those jobs as part of this construction process, and that's important for some numbers I'll talk about here in just a minute, but it's going to be a huge economic driver. Uh, we asked our economist to go back and sharpen her pencil in terms of what dollars flow directly to the city of Flagstaff as a result of this project. And even though Northern Arizona Healthcare is a nonprofit, it doesn't mean that it evades all uh, taxes. So for example, in the very complicated way that Arizona taxes uh, construction, um, uh, NAH gets some breaks as it concerns material, but turns out they will be paying sales tax, for example, on labor. And as a result, um, this project during construction will generate over $6.7 million of sales tax that flows directly to the city. That's not county, that's just to the city of Flagstaff. Additionally, Ongoing taxes from sales tax, BBB tax, transportation tax, uh, uh, the other categories, state sharing, the other categories that flow directly back to the city of Flagstaff will uh, be more than $1.5 million per year in perpetuity uh, as a result of this project. I point these numbers out because I think that they will have to become part of the solutions which was my word, uh, to some of the issues that Tiffany had described for us uh, introducing. So what is on screen now is a proposed timeline to get this case uh, to city council for consideration and we hope approval. Um, this is a timeline that begins uh, October 12, which is when the city would need to send notice to the newspaper to start what will be a three uh, three consecutive meetings of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Under the code, because of the specific plan, uh, there are three meetings before planning and zoning that are required, and then two meetings before uh, the City Council. The, th this program actually begins tomorrow, because if we can get uh, uh, good feedback and instruction from the Council, we actually need to start putting signage on the, on the property as early as tomorrow, sending letters out to those 900 folks that I had mentioned. This is a uh, schedule that was developed in collaboration with the city, but I want to be really clear. This is not a schedule that city staff has approved. This is a schedule that is possible depending on the feedback that we get from you folks today. This is the schedule that we would need to adhere to to allow this city council to consider and vote on this project in December of 2022. If we can't adhere to this schedule, then this project falls into an indetermined period of time in 2023. And uh, I won't go into the issues that that creates, but maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that later. So that being the case, um, I think that there are, um, you know, the, the, T Tiffany identified the issues that are still sort of being worked out and that need to be uh, dealt with. Don't disagree with any of them that she mentioned, but I think overriding, there are two issues that we really need to discuss and uh, to get direction on. They have to do with fire safety and with traffic mitigation. As it concerns fire safety, um, the, uh, the, the, the fire department and Chief Barrett have been generous with their time to meet with us, express what their concerns are, and to start engineering what some solutions might be. Um, as part of this process, as, uh, one thing we were required to do and did do was hire uh, experts to prepare a fire impact analysis. Um, with guidance from the city, we were able to hire the same consultants that the city is using for its ongoing standard of cover analysis. And, and Kevin Roche and um, Adam uh, Teal from FACETS are here actually in the room with us today, which, is, which was not planned and, is, and is hopefully might be a great advantage. The city, uh, Chief Baird tells us that the city is not prepared to take on um, with its current resources, the new hospital that's being proposed. We understand that it's a taller building. It requires special resources. Um, and I'm not gonna speak for the chief, 
but this is a good project and this project isn't what creates at least not on its own uh, the deficit of resources the which is why the standard of cover analysis was taking place in the first place right this hospital is being built along one end of the jw pal corridor which as we all know is going to extend to fourth street the state recently sold 400 acres closer to fourth street that's going to be developed residentially northeast of us is another 400 acres that's going to be developed residentially the, the city needs additional fire protection resources. Um, we are one of the users of those resources and we can be part of the solution for some of those resources. For example, going back to that economic, the economic numbers that I showed, the city's economic impact fees will be having uh, NAH pay over $2 million uh, as part of the construction of the uh, Health Village facilities. And that's in addition to the $6 million of sales tax. And that's in addition to the $1.5 million annually of taxes that are directly uh, generated by this project. Um, but it, and those, those numbers are a big down payment on what needs to occur to solve for fire safety, but they're not gonna cover the entire gap. This, the, the city is going to have to grapple with this. Our doors won't open until 2027 so there's time, not a ton of time, but the city's going to have to grapple with how it's going to provide adequate fire service. And, and the numbers that are up on the board, I'm sure they're too small to read, are, are uh, work product that the chief was generous to provide sort of outlining scenarios. Currently, the city is sort of behind where it should be in terms of fire service levels, putting three men on fire ladder trucks that ought to have four, for example. Um, in, in which case you have to call more units to incidents than you otherwise would. Uh, this is a community-wide issue and a fire protection system, which is a community-wide system. And NAH wants to be part of that solution, but I need to be crystal clear about something. We, we can't solve for the entire gap. And the question ultimately that has to be answered by the council is, are, are you going to say no to a hospital if the hospital can't solve a community-wide fire protection problem? And we hope the answer to that is no, but we want to be part of the solution. On traffic, um, tra traffic is both maybe more complicated, but there might be a, a solution that's a little easier to get our hands around. And um, I don't want to repeat what Tiffany said because I appreciated the, that she went through some of the history here. But we spent about 11 months, you know, sort of talking about what to study. Um, and it generated uh, one of the largest uh, traffic impact analyses, I think, in the history of the town. Um, and it's been and it's been submitted three times to the city, um, uh, once even before the scope was finalized, once after and then more recently here in September to address some follow up questions that traffic staff has had. The scope of this study looked at 34 intersections and street segments uh, in locations as, as far away as 10 miles from this project. It uh, looked at a period of time of 24 years and also then broke down that time period into you know, what needs to happen by 2025, what needs to happen by 2030, what needs to happen by the time the project is fully complete. I, I want to point out as well, NAH is wholesale moving from the current campus to the new campus. The traffic impact analysis doesn't take any credit for the lightening of the traffic load downtown, nor does the traffic impact analysis take any credit for uh, what we all expect will be a new Lone Tree overpass, which will probably pretty dramatically alter what traffic patterns are uh, on that corridor. So we thought about that. And cooperatively with staff, we've come up with um, recommendations. The traffic impact analysis itself proposes as many as 81 off-site traffic mitigation measures. Um, we have also been in discussions for several weeks with the city and, and agree that in a situation like this, there's probably too much to study and really get your arms around the first time through. So NEH has proposed to perform a second traffic impact analysis in the 2030 time frame or before, depending on the rate of development, when we have actual numbers of traffic at the new facility, 
actual numbers of what downtown looks like with the move of the hospital, these kind of things. And with, with newer and more accurate information, take another look at what's going on with traffic and what should mitigation be. In addition to that, um, we are uh, considering and are open to the idea of uh, uh, phasing the zoning request that we put before you. So right now, as Tiffany explained, we're requesting zoning into three zones across the entire 170 acre parcel. But if uh, the needs of traffic analysis mean that we rezone the new hospital site and hold everything off for a little bit while we finish dotting I's and crossing T's, the hospital's open to that idea too. This is not a, this is not a negotiation leverage point for us. We need to get the hospital built. We think we know what the mitigation needs to be to open the hospital, uh, but if we need to continue studying traffic, I think there are ways to do that where the city's not giving up its leverage or its control. And so we've been thinking about those. Um, so uh, NEH is going to build all the on-site traffic mitigation. That's just how that goes. NEH is uh, understands that Beulah needs to be wide. Although I think council input would be helpful here because traffic mitigation on Beulah might widen it to as many as five lanes. Um, and uh, uh, our plan would include bike lanes. It would include uh, foots paths. It's extremely expensive. If, if, if Beulah were to be widened from uh, uh, JW Powell all the way to Lake Mary Road, that's something like a $24 million piece of work right there. Um, the, the mitigation immediately surrounding the hospital would include improving the traffic circles there next to Fort Tothill, as well as a traffic circle to be installed on the east side of the uh, interchange. Uh, but just those improvements alone, making improvements on Gula, making improvements to the interchange, uh, and, and when you apply a proportionality uh, ratio, what's the, what's the hospital's traffic contribution versus what's the background contribution? That's about a $28 million piece for the hospital. It's about a $12 million piece for the city. I'm not sure that it's uh, a number that the hospital can afford. The good news is with the infrastructure bill that was just passed, there are sources of money available today that weren't available prior to that. Um, Senator Cinema has been instrumental in working with us to try to begin to access those. The hospital is very interested in partnering, partnering with the city to make sure that we're grant writing and accessing the funds that are available to us um, so that if we can find sources where the city's not paying and the hospital's not paying, that's all the better. Um, but, but what I just described on Beulah and the interchange is you know, $40 million of traffic mitigation. You have a study that reaches as far as I-40 and Continental. And, and, and if you add up the other parts of those 81 offsite traffic, potential traffic mitigation pieces, you know, now you're talking tens and tens of millions of dollars, the vast majority of which would fall to the city and only a small sliver to NAH. So in our view, what we really want to do is focus on what's going to happen at the new hospital and make sure that it's mitigated appropriately. So I'm going to leave you with this slide. This is the schedule um, that I had mentioned. Um, as Tiffany pointed out, meetings between the hospital and the city have been occurring since 2019. Uh, her, her team has put in an enormous amount of time to keep this project moving forward. Our team has been doing the same. This, this, is, a, this is not a rezoning project, folks. This is not a, a discrete hospital being built. This is, this is a city and regional asset that will serve and anchor our community for decades. But it has to get pushed across the finish line. And it's with this council that we've worked over the past two years, incorporating really good and important ideas. But for this council to finish this project and for us to finish this project on a timeline that allows us to, to not start cutting services and to not, you know, to, to make it everything that NAH wants it to be, you got to get it across the finish line. And that's this timeline and that's what we hope to talk about today. Let's give it a hand. 
Thank you, Whitney. A lot of information, yes? Will you take 30 seconds? Everyone in the room, will you turn to your neighbors? Don't leave anybody out. And will you share with them one thing that you have just learned from one of the presenters? One new bit of information that you didn't know before that you've just learned. 30 seconds, go. All right, let's come on back together. Thank you for your willingness to pay attention to engage in what an excellent this discussion we're just about to have as soon as we have a break. We're going to take a 15 minute break, five minutes ahead of schedule. Incredible job, Whitney and Steve and Tiffany. So we're going to come back together at 10 past three. Please notice there are drinks in the back. There are restrooms right here. Have a great conversation and we'll, then we'll start sharply at 310 for discussion. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. All right, everybody, welcome back. And now let's start having conversation. How wonderful that we're all on the same team, right? With a common goal, looking towards the future and getting some clarity. So let's start things off. We're going to kind of be focusing inward because the idea is for the council to make a decision. And so we want to be able to share more information, ask more, more questions. So council member Aslan, would you mind starting us off? Oh, thank you very much. Um, first thing I want to say is Tiffany, you're a rock star. Thank you so much for representing the city's uh, concerns as, as well as you did. And from such a distance, you did a very good job speaking off the cuff. This is clearly the water that you swim in uh, and you're very good at speaking to it. Um, also, Greg, I want to thank you for making the space available and the, the time to do this. This is a very important conversation. Um, it's wonderful that we've been able to get together and, and make some decisions here. You deserve that clarity, um, and we deserve the opportunity to, to hear all sides of this and, and come to the most informed decision we possibly can. Um, I want to start by saying, uh, I don't understand why the mayor recused himself from this conversation. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one. And so any additional clarity that Mayor Deasy might be able to offer on that front would be immensely appreciated. And I don't mean, I don't say that, I don't mean to wag a finger. I actually really happen to believe his input would be critical in this conversation. And uh, I wish he were here. Um, so, you know, Julie asked us to sort of do a key takeaway from the, the first part of the, the conversation, uh, the presentations, and Council Member Salas and I were agreeing uh, that we were sort of shocked by the room sizes, and it just really encapsulated the pressure you guys are under to grow and to expand and to um, meet the needs of the community. Uh, you know, I haven't been a patient at NAH yet. Uh, I'm training for a half marathon right now, so that may change. <laughs> um, but joking aside, further into the future, uh, should a hospital visit, overnight visit need arise, um, I would love the additional amenities that you guys are proposing. And I want to very much keep that in mind from the perspective of any constituent who lives in the from Flagstaff to the greater region. Uh, these are important matters and you guys are trying to do an important thing and you're you're at the table in good faith and the constraints that you have voiced are very real. Um, I do think there are still some sticky points to all this uh, and I hope uh, council that we're not going to rush into a decision today. Um, and I'm not saying that this happened, it's just for lack of a better phraseology I don't want to feel 
uh, pressured or bullied or pushed or shamed into uh, making a decision this big um, based off of some of the points that were very well made about how important the timing is here. Um, but, you know, council received a letter from the local fire union expressing uh, some great concerns over the additional burden they're going to be forced to shoulder uh, without receiving sufficient um, support. And I want you guys to know that I deeply share that concern. Um, as a first responder myself, I know what some of the things are they're talking about, and it's not just about the ladder truck. It's about uh, the the quality of life that they already feel is very strained um, and just the, the, the level of support that they feel they're stretched too thin already to provide. And uh, it's it's not fair to saddle them with extra stress without a sufficient commitment from NAH to cover the gap that this project represents. Um, I'm not talking about the existing gap that, you, that was alluded to. That's a very good point that you made. And it's definitely something that we need to grapple with as a city, and it's not your fault. Any decision I come to on this, um, I want to be fair and balanced. Uh, I don't want this to be something um, where we're asking you to overextend yourself or provide resources that is just clearly um, out of your wheelhouse or something that you're incapable of doing. Um, and, you know, I, I weigh more than one concern as a city council member. There's a lot of um, synergistic interests, and there are some competing um, sticky points that all need to be balanced in this. Um, but the union um, needs to be uh, put in the context of the whole picture. Um, but I will be monitoring their response to your proposed solutions very closely. Um, and I feel that I can't rush that. Um, that's something that needs to play out. Um, and uh, they need to feel brought to the table and listened to. That doesn't necessarily mean they need to be capitulated to, uh, for lack of a better term. I do want to make sure that that space is there. And I would say that with any of the uh, stakeholders or interest groups that are looking to be able to weigh in on this, from F cubed to uh, the Naval Observatory um, and, and beyond. And I appreciate you guys putting forward this timeline, it's helpful to consider. It's helpful to know that there is a roadmap that gets us uh, to a second read before the end of the year. I don't I don't know that it's it's essential that this council makes this decision. I think uh, the next council can be brought up to speed with in relatively short order. Um, and so that concern doesn't impress me much. Um, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'll leave my thoughts there for now, but that's uh, I have some pretty strong feelings about this. And, and I, I, I do feel the level of tension there. And, um, you know, the, just to wrap up, I think I think the, the union's uh, concerns is an early sticking point for me. And if we can get past that, uh, I'm very much looking forward to being as supportive as I can to get us across the finish line, because I believe and I know that this project would be an enormous amenity to the community. Um, but this is our opportunity to weigh in uh, and, and create some space for that tension that needs to play out. And uh, I feel that that's where we're at right now. Can I just add something to that? Yeah, I'm done. Um, so we um, agree on the fire piece of things. Um, when this was brought to NIH's attention, we immediately got facets under contract to, to do that conditions assessment. They're in the room with us today, and we already have them under contract to, to do that. Um, we feel confident that that work can be done, um, digested, and coordinated with the fire department and still meet this schedule before we get to council. Can I interrupt for a moment? Can anyone hear? Yes? If you're okay, so we're gonna all try and speak up and also feel free to bring chairs down the middle if you're struggling, struggling to hear. Please continue. Good. Council Member Uh thank you. I guess I'll put my camera on in case anybody cares. Um, yeah, there's some big issues, but I want to talk about what I hope is a minor issue first. Um 
I heard both Steve and Tiffany bring up the issue of noise. Now, I know that in the city, we have some very serious noise issues where people can't sleep in their house. And so one way to solve that is you move music, loud music, which I like like anybody else, out to a Pepsi Amphitheater. And uh, that's working out really well. Uh, I don't, I've don't. i never heard a single complaint about noise from Pepsi Amphitheater, and there's, it's pretty loud out there. So I guess my question is, um, if noise is such a consideration, which uh, Steve and Tiffany said that it is, are we going to have a situation where the hospital asks uh, Pepsi Amphitheater to kind of tone down and not have so many concerts or or put rules on the noise level. Um, you know, even though I strongly support some of those rules for inside the city, I think they would be really burdensome in a place like Pepsi Amphitheater, which was specifically built away from town so that they wouldn't have these issues. So does my question kind of make sense? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think we'll be making that request in the future. Uh, and our architecture team is here, but I think we can accommodate that from an acoustical perspective with the design of our building. Okay. Um, all right, so moving on, thank you. Um, I guess I'll follow up in Mr. Aslan's comments a little bit. Um, you know, a phrase that I thought of a few minutes ago is proportional responsibility. I think it makes sense for uh, the hospital to pay for the proportional responsibility uh, for the various things. Um, and in effect, that says, let's play fair. You know, in my mind, to have the hospital be responsible for some interchange uh, improvement out at Country Club Road or something seems a little absurd. Now, if they're talking about are they responsible for making Beulah into a, whatever it needs to be, four or five lane street? Yes. Um, proportional responsibility. I think the state's going to pay to replace the bridge that goes across the freeway by the free, by the airport. Um, maybe it makes sense to have, you know, the state pay for that. What would that would cost? And then they would pay the added cost of, well, we really need four lanes now. So I don't know what that proportion is, 30%, 60%, whatever. So philosophically, that's kind of where I'm at. I want to play fair. It sounds like we have, well, the next thing I want to bring up is, I don't know that today we have enough information to say this, that, or the other thing in any definitive way. For instance, I've heard some discussion about fire department issues. And I've heard some discussion about transportation issues, but I'm thinking that in my mind, I need some more input from staff about what we really need, what the proposed uh, pro the proportional responsibility is. So I can't say yes or no, because we haven't been presented with anything specific. So, you know, I'm very open-minded about these discussions, if we can meet that schedule, great. If we don't, like Mr. Aslan said, that's not the end of the world in my mind. So uh, I guess, are we being asked to say, well, let's try to go for the schedule, if at all possible, that, that uh, the transportation and fire and police or whatever needs to be worked out can be done in that amount of time? Uh, yes, I'm very open-minded about that. But I'm, I ready to say, yes, I support this project as presented. Well, it isn't fully presented yet. So I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but I think you get the idea of where my head's at. Thank you. Thank you. Have, um, council member uh, Shimoni. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And, and Julie, were you gonna, is there something else you wanted to add? Nope. Okay, very good. Um, good. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for your time and your leadership and, and what you do in our community and the presentation that you've, you've brought to us today. Uh, very excited about the plans and the new location. As you know, uh, Steve 
obviously you and I have met many times as uh, over over this past year plus and, and the team and I think you all have done a really good job um, thus far. So I do have some comments and I have some questions I, I'm going to kind of sprinkle in together and go through my little list. Um, and so I want to start off by just saying that councils declared two emergencies and that's been my lens on this whole question about the re the new campus from the beginning those emergencies being climate and housing right so um those are at the front of my mind as i look through uh, my lens as a council member at this project so commitment and goals to be set for climate action resiliency and reducing greenhouse gas emissions for this project are a priority and a value of mine and i believe this council's so uh, that needs to be set, and I know staff is working with you on it, but it sounds like we're not quite there yet. Um, buildings should strive for net zero. I, I'm sure, Stephen, you probably know, and I'd love for you to speak to that. Um, net, net zero healthcare is a growing movement, and and that uh, healthcare provides about uh, contributes about 10% of of the country's greenhouse gas emissions. So this would be a huge place a huge uh, way for us to to really set a uh, a new new standard and and really uh, a step forward when it comes to neutrality oakland has the first hospital to be a net zero hospital in the states to my research and it'd be great for flagstaff to be second or at least come close to that so things like solar uh, Vice Mayor, I know you really like and appreciate solar use and, and so solar electrification where possible of the space and water heaters, wh whatever we can. I, understanding that some of the, um, the the tools that you all use and the machines you use might not be able to meet these goals and needs um, where we can making this happen. That's a big priority to me individually and I think to this council at large. Um, Creation of a transportation demand management program would go a long way here to reduce car travel to the site, which might result in a savings in terms of what is needed. But I think we need a transportation demand management program. And I know that uh, staff is working with you on that as well, but that's not yet in place. I want to say thank you for your partnership and, and collaboration with Mountain Line and Mountain Line leadership. It's my understanding that you're hoping to do a more phased in approach rather than a fixed fixed route at the beginning. And I can appreciate that, but I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that partnership and, and thank you for that. Uh, on the topic of roundabouts, uh, I did hear Tiffany, you say that they are single lane and that's wonderful, but if we are struggling with that option, protected intersections is what I'd hope we also would consider if we go the intersection route. Um, Love that we're talking about small workout stations along the foot. Fully support that. And um, so here's a question, Steve, if you don't mind uh, answering. So NAH is planning to employ around 4,000 employees, making you all the largest partner and employer in northern Arizona, um, which is massive and wonderful. Are these mostly predominantly high wage employees? And how does NAH plan to house these 4,000 employees? Um, Okay, so just for clarification, the entire health and wellness village is proposed to have 4,000 employees when completely built out um, in the 2040-2045 timeframe. Um, NAH's uh, plan from an employment perspective, phase one, meaning opening of the hospital in 2027, is intended to be employee neutral just for NAH. Um, while we are increasing in size, um, we are also increasing in efficiencies, which will help us to overcome the staffing challenges of staffing a, a larger facility. Um, so we we do uh, we do have a proposed 315 unit multifamily housing development on our project. Um, right now, we we have a development partner um, who is willing to commit to 10% of that being tax credit backed. Um, low income housing. Um, I think we would be open to investigating that further. Um, it's hard to put together what the economics of that deal look like without a firm timeline and understanding of when it's going to happen and how it's going to roll out. Um, so from an from NAH specifically, um, we don't see a, a large increase from an employment perspective in this phase one. We do show 
um, additional bed capacity in the future. Um, so 44 beds of capacity that could grow within the uh, confines of the building we're building that opens in 2027. And then ultimately a third bed tower that could include um, another 96 or so beds. Uh, we have employee growth built into the model moving forward. Um, but the, the difference between our current employment and the 4,000 is some of the employees that are around the hospital themselves. Um, uh, Councilman Schoen, I think, as you, you know, the hospital itself is a, is a mix of, of salaries from an employment perspective. Um, but I would think that a high percentage of our employment base would be considered in the uh, middle income workforce um, model. Thank you for that. And, and Steve, when, so in that first phase, how many employees do you plan to have? Is it 315 or what do you think? What do you think that number will be? Oh, I think we'll be at about 2000 employees when we move, but that's how many employees we have now. Right. At, but, at FNC. Right. And a lot of those individuals are going to move with the new location. I do not know that to be true. I, I would think that we would have some employees that would, would relocate. Um, I, I would think that we have some employees who are currently um, either struggling to find housing in Flagstaff proper and or renting that might want to um, look at moving onto the new campus in the units that we're providing. Um, but we have not done an internal housing assessment of what our employees are going to be doing in five years. Okay, so so council, um, vice mayor, and, and everybody on this on this meeting, you know, I, I obviously, Steve, and you and I have talked a lot about housing on the site, and, and I've talked about the, that with the team. and. I just don't know if 315 is adequate. Um, I, I do have concerns about that. Um, and I guess I'll just voice them here. I, I think, you know, we were talking about a LIHTC project, low income tax credit housing project that would maybe house 400, 500 individuals um, on, uh, on the site, on the new site, not the old one. But um, we can circle back to that later. So I do have some concerns about the housing. Um, okay, so moving along almost to the end of my list. So in terms in terms of the fire concerns, I think that they're very valid concerns, obviously. And given how big of a a project this is, and that this is the only the second the second uh, specific plan in our city of Flagstaff with this 112 foot 160 foot height uh, building, uh, I think that we really do need to take the fire concerns seriously. And, and Councilmember Aslan, thank you for bringing that up. And so I think we need to work through that sticky point, as was mentioned as well, a little bit further before I feel really comfortable about us moving forward here. And then um, transparency was mentioned. Um, Steve, I think you, you were talking about transparency and I do appreciate all the transparency and community engagement. Uh, I just will, will go ahead and, and share that. I have heard rumblings about pressure, pressure to submit letters, pressure not to speak out, and I don't know where that pressure is coming from, from NAH to whether it's employers or whoever it is, but uh, hopefully you know what I'm talking about. And, and I just think that we need to address that up front and make sure that people feel comfortable and safe uh, speaking up and, and sharing what it is that they believe is their truth and not feeling like they might be at a consequence for doing so. Yeah, um, I, but I do. I, I, I'm not familiar with what you're talking about. Would love to understand more information. Um, we we are not internally as NIH pressuring any community groups and or NIH employees. We, we, we do have a letter writing campaign internally and externally where we are asking people to write letters. But um, to my knowledge, we have never said to any group and or employee that there would be any consequences in not supporting us. So would love to understand more about that if that's happening. Okay. Absolutely. We will talk more and I will get you more information. Thank you for that. And I know your intention is in the right place. Um, and then, you know, just in closing, uh, I appreciate the timeline that's being presented here. Uh, I do want us to do it right. I think that, you know, if you tuned into our retreat at all earlier today, you see that the city is getting things done and big things done. And there's great leadership in place. Even though we are understaffed, we are accomplishing major lifts for our community left and right. It's incredible to be a part of. And so I don't think that that's a worry of mine is getting it done. It's just a matter about when, right? And ideally it'd be before our term is up as this council. I'd love to see this project through, but at the same time, I don't want to rush things. I want to do them right. And I want staff to be fully behind what it is we're doing in the community and the council as well. So I appreciate the timeline. I don't know if it's realistic, but uh, I just wanted to share that. I think we need to get it done, but we need to do it right, correct? Um, 
And that is all. Thank you for, for entertaining my comments and for being with us today. And we will definitely continue conversations about this. Thank you. <laughs> questions, comments, more things to share, more questions to ask. Vice Mayor Sweet. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here and taking the immense amount of time to be transparent and meet with the community council. Um, you know, I I would like to see this move forward and I'm okay with the timeline. However, as a council, it sounding like we don't want to rush things. And I, I know you can appreciate that. We want it done right. I'm not positive it has to be with this council, but I, I too would like to see that timeline happen. However, I do feel that fire is definitely a big hurdle that maybe we're coming up against. And I don't know how to address that between now and that timeline. If we can do it, great. Yeah. If we can um, move forward in the right manner, I would like to do that. Um, I like the idea that Council Member Shoney brought up about the climate and the net zero healthcare. I would like to learn more about that. Um, Mountain Line, I, I appreciate that you all are working with them in the phased in approach. Um, it goes a long way with me as long as it's in the forefront of this project. Um, I'm okay with phasing that. And the housing, I appreciate that you're tackling that. And, um, you know, it's, it's crucial that we, that it's part of the project. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm excited for this project. I had to take my friend to the ER a year ago and it was not the best experience. Um, so I think there is a definite need for this new hospital campus and I'm very excited. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, I am I'm I'm thankful, uh, Mr. Clifton, that we have allowed for the time and space to have this discussion in an open meeting setting. And I, I was outspoken in, in, in letting council know and see the decision manager know that it's time to bring this uh, discussion to the public, which is now. Um, first of all, I don't, I don't want to lose sight that NIH provides the leading healthcare service, services for flag staff in the region. Uh, providing critical services, especially to to our our uh, Native American neighbors. I do understand to, that to meet current and the future needs of our community, and NIH needs to grow and expand in another location. Um, and I am uh, impressed. Uh, on the forecast of, of uh, the economic impact. I believe, you know, the 387 million in economic benefits for the community when completed, the 6.7 million construction related sales tax to the city. Um, and I have here in my notes, 4.5 million in annual tax revenue benefiting FUSD and Coconino Community College. And of course, wearing my workforce development hat, NAH is a strategic partner in bolstering healthcare related career pathways and job training. Of course, bring hundreds of jobs, highway jobs, and of course, addressing housing needs. Um, I still believe in the city's policy of devel development paying for itself. The city, the city is not in the position to shoulder the burden of cost of any development, to address the significant increases to the city's fire protection and service delivery demands, 
and enhancement to current capabilities are necessary to support the rezoning of the proposed new location. And I think once the city has, we have, the city and, and uh, NAH has check off the fire mitigation, I think that will lead us in horse racing. You have to lock in the horse to get to the finish line. And I think addressing the fire mitigation is locking in. Uh, and I and and and, and I have um, I fully understand that NHH is, has committed to best efforts in implementing sustainability features into their development, and that is that commitment is you know is documented today, and uh, and there will be accountability uh, uh, moving forward. But I believe NAH has the opportunity today to leverage its, its resources to partner with the state of Flagstaff, Coconino County, Napta Mountain Line, ADOT, and Metroplan in providing public transit services and uh, transportation infrastructure improvement. Uh, the public transit, transit services through ADN all the way to north of Sedona, and in terms of uh, JW Powell Bridge, uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, preservation and expansion. It's already on ADOT's uh, five, five year, five year um, uh, transportation program. So ADOT is is uh, already embarking on uh, improving uh, the JW Powell Bridge over I-17. So it's perfect timing for NHH to be a a, a partner in all of this. Um, developments, whether it's transit and, and transportation. Um, lastly, um, I talked about synergy earlier. That means, you know, we are collaborating, partnering, where synergy means um, the whole is much greater than the sum of its part. So between the city's effort and, and uh, you know, partnering with many partners I've mentioned before, it's creating synergy. And uh, to quote one of uh, my favorite songs from the Beatles, when we work together, when we come together, one and one is three. So now, how do we get to October 12th? to the finish line. Can I ask both staff and, and NHH? Uh, I, have a, I have a question that I'll ask. I, if everyone remembers at the beginning of this, my, my word was clarity, so I'm gonna ask for clarity. Um, Councilman Asim, I'll direct a question to you just because you were the first one to go and bring up the fire mitigation issue. I know other council members brought it up, but from a clarity perspective, when, when council says to NAH that there is an expectation that we clear up the fire mitigation concern, what, what exactly is that concern? Is it the concern uh, the day we open the doors of the hospital in 2027 that we have a plan to address the gap? Uh, I've read that letter that the firefighters union um, wrote. They they point out a lot of current issues, and for us to understand how to close the gap the day we open in 2027, we need to understand what that gap looks like in 2027. So I think I'm kind of kind of turn around to the city, both from a staff and council perspective. What is the city's plan to close the gap from now to 2027, so we understand the gap we're creating in 2027. Yeah, I, uh, I think that's a question for Greg, but I can take a stab at answering some of this myself. And what I'd like to focus on is the opportunity I see here. I do see opportunity for negotiation and figuring out uh, something that works um, on, on, that, on that temporal scale. It's, it's not an immediate uh, itch that needs to be scratched. Um, I, but I, I do think um, our public safety personnel uh, understand planning ahead. Um, you know, we need to start preparing our uh, nuts for the winter here. Um, to, to, to use an absurd analogy, uh, it's already out there, so let's <laughs> with it. Um, so, no, this is about the future. This is about down the road. 
Uh, and I, again, this comes back to the idea of synergy that Councilmember Saul has brought up. Uh, we have our own heavy lift to do on that front. Um, and we need to be working closely on that, but I don't want to get to an operational stage where our fire department and our public safety personnel are feeling attenuated and stretched thin because of the move that happened. Yeah. Uh, and a, a commitment to getting there um, is really important to me. And I don't know uh, procedurally how we come to an arrangement about that to trigger this timeline that you have. Yeah. Um, but I feel an organic opportunity to sort of go back and forth on that in the next hour here and yes. see if we can come and, to something. And we agree. And I think that's why I, I wanted to maybe add, and, and, and City Manager Clifton, maybe the question is for you. I think, you know, if, if we're really seeking clarity here, right, the, the, the question I'm hearing the city ask of NAH is, are we willing to commit to our proportional share of the problem that we're creating by opening this campus in 2027? I don't know what that is because I can't state or no one has stated for me what the gap in 2027 is going to be from what the operating deficiencies of the fire department will be to what we are going to cause. So we sit here and we look at this schedule and we say we can't meet the schedule because we can't answer that question. I don't know what the question is to be answered right now because there's been no parameters put around it. So if the question is, are we willing to commit to the difference between a, a fully staffed, fully operational fire department and what we create with our development? I think the answer to that is yes. Are we willing to, but to just go out into the space and not understand what that looks like? That's an impossible question for us to answer. Um, I am open to suggestions. I was talking um, with the chief during the, during the break. If if we can somehow help and look at a fee structure that front loads some of those fees for us earlier on in the development than 2027, but still makes NIH only pay their proportional share. If that would help from a front loading perspective, that's an absolutely a discussion that we'd be willing to have. But it's a really difficult question to answer because I still don't understand what the question okay. is. Um, and Greg, before you answer, I, I know Councilmember Shimoni had a question for the chief related to fire. It might be a nice opportunity to. I don't know what his question is, but it it's time for you to come up. Thank you, and thank you, Councilor Aslan. It is relevant. I think it would be helpful. Chief, I guess my question is, I can lead you off with to, to jump in on this conversation, is in regards to current levels of service and and what, if we were to lessen our 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 standard in terms of what it is that we're asking NAH to provide to maybe something that's more relevant with our current levels across the city or relevant locations that are similar, however we calculate that, what would that look like and would that help in terms of creating a more clear uh, goalpost for NAH and the city to work towards in, in finding a, a compromise that we feel is a win-win, but yet maybe isn't exactly what we ideally would want, but also recognizes that we too are a little bit behind on staying on top of this ourselves. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, our last meeting with NAH, we talked about the uh, levels of service shortfalls that we have in the city of Flagstaff and clearly wanted to state that uh, they did not cause it. Uh, we've been experiencing growth and we haven't been increasing resources sufficient to that growth. Certainly, we wouldn't anticipate that they should. Uh, make us whole for the policy questions of the past 10, 15 years. Um, having said that, we also understand that um, their rezoning application represents a very high risk addition to that already under-resourced demand. And so working through that is is really uh, where we're, we're kind of working currently with NAH. I think we're on the right track. If you uh, saw the slide sh uh, show that showed the three scenarios earlier on the uh, PowerPoint presentation, scenario three is really a uh, an extension of uh, the current service delivery now. 
Um, NAH's uh, consultant report gave us a really um, nice heads up as far as beginning to articulate what the gap in service delivery is. That's noted by the scenario um, one. Uh, I will tell you that given the results of a standards of cover survey that we will enjoy in a about, I'm being told 60 days, which is I think all these days weeks ago. is light speed for standards of cover, um, but we anticipate their consultants can pull it off. Um, that, will, that will articulate that at a much more um, realistic level, a little less conceptual than the initial report. So scenario three for me, council member, um, looks like a level of service that more replicates the extension of what we currently have. And if the development occurs, it won't represent lowering the service level on the rest of the community, which if we don't add resources will be exactly what we'll do. So appreciate that, Chief. Thank you. So if if I'm if I'm hearing that correctly, and that number is 2.3 million dollars, our um, economic impact report shows that we generate two million dollars directly to the fire department from a development fee perspective. Um, so that covers two of that 2.3 million dollars. And if the discussion is whether or not you know potentially we could front load those development impact fees as opposed to meter them out over the course of the development fee, I think that'd be something we'd be open to discussion on. But um, so that's kind of what I was looking for was, you know, we, we hear a lot about fire mitigation. We've heard about it for a couple of weeks now, but no one's kind of articulated what the ask is of us. And if the ask is to continue the level of standard coverage that the city has now, um, but reinforce it for what our development is, and that number is $2.3 million. Well, we're already bringing $2 million to the table. That's without what we're going to bring, the millions of dollars we're going to bring in construction tax that we feel could also be repurposed towards the fire department. Um, but if, if that's a, a workable solution where our um, fire impact fees across the entire development, not just the hospital, get front loaded, I think that's something that we would be willing to talk about and a workable solution for us. And Vice Mayor. If, I apologize. Uh, I think it's an important Next. distinction for the city council to understand is development impact fees are provided a statute for us to um, collect fees from new development, new growth in the community, and it can only uh, be applied towards um, capital equipment, fire stations, fire trucks, things of that nature. The, those funds will not put boots on the ground. And that is that is the traditional dilemma that all growing communities have is trying to understand how to match the operational component with the capital component. Development impact fees are a tremendous tool to be utilized in this development. They can be utilized for cost recovery for the first developer, and we've seen that done in numerous places. But it doesn't put firefighters on the street. But Chief, would it, would it be fair to say that all of the say that, and I believe that the next discussion that we'll be having with your team is trying to extrapolate what that looks like. That's an annual <laughs> expense. Right. It's not a one-time expense, right. and so we need to evaluate. And you've been uh, you've been sharpening your uh, economic. Uh, impact analysis. I think we're at a place where we may be able to do that. But we need to kind of, uh, I think if we were talking about at the break, we need to kind of phase that and scale it. Yep. And then we can begin to see where the gap is and where the problem lies. Do, do you feel comfortable with facets on board, um, knowing what we're working on, knowing the discussions that are taking place, that you think we could get to that point and still meet that timeline and be in front of council? I think we're having the right conversations, as I mentioned at the break, it's an aggressive schedule. But you know, I think we're talking about the right thing. Okay, thank you. Council member Shimoni and then McCarthy. You know, Vice Mayor, why don't you come back to me? I think my questions on fire have been answered. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. Chief, is the concern mostly about having enough engines and enough manpower 
Or are you also concerned about this high building and that might bring uh, new challenges to your fire department? Are you concerned about that or is it more just a manpower thing? It's both. Oh, it's both. The high, rise, the high rise presents problems on typical, uh, you know, and, and institutional high rise facilities, medical facilities are, are not immune from small emergencies. <clears throat> small emergency on the top floor is a lot more difficult than going through the front door of Mrs. Smith's house. Much more resources are required. And so that's that becomes part of the issue. The other part of the issue is that we do not generate enough firefighting resources, manpower for existing risk, even with that this development. Right. So this development will go on for four or five years, whatever it is. It would seem to me that in four or five years, we can work out our manpower issues with uh, Mr. Clemson's great at finding money, right? He <laughs> <laughs> chokes. Uh, but seriously, I would think that we could somehow address those issues. Now, if there's special issues because of the very high building, uh, I don't know how that'll get addressed. Um, let me ask a money about taxes. We've talked about tax. Okay, construction will generate a lot of tax money. And maybe that could go towards the fire department. But that that'll be over in, by the time it's open. So the, the hospital itself, will it generate tax money that can cover the added manpower needed to cover the hospital? Or, you know, and, and I understand that there's maybe some retail on site and everything. Yeah. I don't know if it's fair to, to count that because, you know, that'll be its own demand and its own tax generation. So how do we cover the ongoing higher manpower costs that will go on, you know, for 50 years? I think our, our economic development report kind of clearly outlines what we're going to generate from a tax perspective. What what we can't say as a healthcare system is how the city directs those funds. We, we don't have say in how those funds are directed, so we know what we're going to generate from a construction sales tax perspective. We know what we're going to generate from a development fee perspective. We go into great detail on not only our property, um, but also the surrounding property into what taxes they are going to generate. But at some point, the city has to be the one that dictates that those funds flow to the fire department to fix this deficiency. That's not something NAH can be responsible. So just to close my comments, uh, I think we can work this out. The fire I, I agree. There's other issues maybe we can talk about next. But in my mind, uh, I don't see an insurmountable problem here with the fire coverage. You know, if there's issues that have nothing to do with the new hospital, uh, that's not their problem. Thank you. We can, we, city has a responsibility to work that out one way or the other. If there's problems about the high building, well, hopefully we can address that. But uh, I think this can be resolved, in my opinion. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, thank you Acting Mayor. Councilmember Essen. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, you know, I see that NEH is ready to move a little bit on this. Um, I sense your eagerness uh, to get to a yes. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how I feel about uh, using a gentleman's ag agreement as enough to trigger this aggressive timeline years. So I I'm still feeling a little stuck here and I I I I, I just wonder if there are ways um, that you could reassert uh, as clearly as possible yep. um, your commitment to uh, your fair share of that goal and keeping in mind that there, there may be some conflicting notions of what that fair share is. So there's going to be continued tension moving forward here. Um, but, if, but if this is a conversation that uh, you guys are really eager to put behind you, um, then yeah, I'm, 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 I'm just wondering if, if that's enough or not. Yeah. I'm just thinking out loud here. I'm going to, I'm going to give and, Whitney a second here. In one second, I just want to just uh, speak for, from an NH perspective. We're not looking for just a gentleman's agreement. Um, we're looking for that clarity of what is what is the proportional share for us? And that's mm -hmm. a question that's never been never been answered for us. Um, and we're not um, 
So we're not looking to kind of kick the can down the road, right? If the question is that the city fully intends to fund the fire department to its full capacity to, to uh, get rid of the current deficit by the time we open the doors and the responsibility that you're asking us for is the difference between that and opening, then we're committed to helping with that. But we can't answer a question that hasn't been outlined. Mm -hmm. And Vice Mayor, um, this might be a good time to have the city manager chime in because uh, his name was invoked early on in this conversation and he's been very patient with it. City manager? Well, thank you. Not having the numbers at hand, and which might be good because we're speaking at a very high level here. And by the way, I think uh, this discussion is accomplishing exactly what we felt that the staff level needed to be accomplished, which is having clarity of more salient points and maybe even looking, probing into possible solutions uh, without necessarily immersing ourselves in the details. And there's a lot of details uh, behind this. So at a high level, I think it is the city's responsibility to bring its all of its divisions and specifically public safety uh, to the status that that is needed to serve our community at, at the level of service that is demanded upon us. Upon us. I don't know um, exactly what that translates into in terms of personnel and equipment. You and I, Chief, have had talks about a new fire station and and we know that's out there on the horizon uh that's a part of it uh we've had some successes this year in uh, equipment but we know that's an ongoing thing but we need to have discussion about the personnel and the operational cost uh this this the city is obligated to uh, try to to close that gap i'm stopping short of saying that we will completely close the gap I think probably a more accurate statement is we need to make progress, significant progress to close that gap, uh, recognizing that it, it's going to be a journey and it's going to take some time. Uh, and by the time we, we get to where we need to be, it will probably continue. You know, the gaps over time will widen because growth will not stop. Um, and so I think that commitment is there. Um, it's, it's, mostly budgetary. Uh, we're making progress. I don't want to talk about what has happened because I, I don't think I think that detracts from the conversation at hand. Uh, we've been working hard, I will note, to to uh, bring our firefighters compensation to where it needs to be. And, and there have been huge strides in that regard. But the other part of it now is making sure we do have enough boots on the ground. And that's where we that's where the gap exists and that's what we need to address. So I, I think the takeaway what NAH should hear in all of that is we don't have an expectation that any new development uh, is going to be saddled with having to close a gap from an operational cost standpoint for city personnel that, that has come about for different reasons. Uh, that would not be fair. Um, does that help uh, address your immense thing? Well, okay. thank you. And also, uh, just to cl uh, clarify one other thing, um, when we we're talking about boots on the ground, and feel free to augment this, but I think what we're talking about is making sure that we have four men or women on every truck. And as part of that, two medics need to be on every truck. Uh, and we're just not there right now. The examples that you see here now do not correct that anywhere except in the scenario three staff so it doesn't correct corporate staffing uh system wide uh, does not apply for that um, so that scenario two that does and that's why it's there because that was brought into the discussion by the, by the uh, memorandum from the union so i thought i'd put that in there so that we kind of see what that looks like in the context of value but so councilman as i think just to be clear we're, we're not asking for a gentleman's agreement, we're not asking to kick the can down the road to 2027. What, what we are asking for is to detach the existing ongoing operational and budgetary issues the fire department has from our path forward to getting this project approved. Just a brief comment. Uh, I want to address the idea of a gentleman's agreement. The gentleman's agreement is completely adequate for today. 
by the time we get a development agreement, it'll all be in writing. Agreed. Uh, if I may, City Manager, I, I, again, I feel optimistic that we're having the right conversations. Uh, we can begin to use this tool that you see here as a way to uh, provide specificity to the discussion over time. We can then blend into this analysis, the analysis of the economic impact analysis. And we can begin to uh, articulate what those could look like. And I, I think that and you know, I, I think if that is acceptable, if we come up with something that's acceptable, then you have the ability then to consider that and whether you want to change zoning and allow this more intensive use to occur. If you're comfortable with what we come up with, I'm, that's what I'm, I'm working to give you that choice right now with, with the applicant. Thank you. That's great to hear. Um, and I'll, I'll just note, you know, this is a really neat, synergistic opportunity. Uh, in a way, you're able to hold the city of Flagstaff's feet to the fire to getting us to where we already need to be in order to leverage the additional resources that you're going to have to pull up um, to keep us uh, from getting too attenuated. And I see that as a good win. Yeah, thank you. Council Member Shimoni. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I did mention in my in my comment in the chat that this is not fire related. So if others do have comments about fire, I'm sorry, I'm going to take us away from that for a minute. But I do feel good about where we're at with fire and, and moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to talk briefly again just about housing. I did some math. Uh, NAU has about 23,000 individuals, whether they're working or students on campus, give or take, and they have about 10,000 living on campus. So that is high. That is definitely not the, the common uh, average across the nation. But if we did require 30% of your workforce to be living on site of the 2000, Steve, Steve that, that's 600 beds in total that would be needed. And so 315, I think, is, is about halfway there, maybe even a little bit more. But I um, just wanted to make that comment to, to council that I do think more additional housing is, is needed here for me to feel good about this, this effort. Um, I do wanna circle back to commitment, commitments and goals around sustainability. Uh, I do know that we're starting to run out of time, so I do have faith in staff being able to work with you and, and, and working on those commitment and goals, um, assuming there's council support for that. And then lastly, on the topic of the timeline, I'm curious, uh, Tiffany and staff, what would you need in order to meet this timeline? Um, I'm guessing it's going to be, you know, submission of, of documents correctly and timely, and then counsel to weigh in on the appropriate phasing uh, of certain requests. But Tiffany or, or someone from staff, can you speak to that? Uh, sure. Um, uh, you know, we've provided NAH with sort of a detailed list of what needs to be a part of what is what we're considering a smaller application. So you have to remember, I mean, and we haven't completely decided 100% what that small application looks like. Um, it may include some of the housing now. It may not. Um, if it means moving forward with just the housing right now, then that housing conversation, for example, remains fluid and open as we work through phase two of what I like to call the entitlement cases. Um, but really what I, what we're looking for now, um, the, the hospital and the ambulatory surgical center really being the biggest component of this health village, uh, trigger the most significant development requirements, impacts. Um, and so figuring out what is the minimal mitigation that's required for that part of the facility. Um, we've talked a lot about fire. That's fire has been a, a big concern in terms of the hospital and ambulatory surgical center. Sounds like we're working toward, on the process of getting towards development agreement. Um, but the other big issue that is still an outlier is the transportation. Um, and that transportation mitigation for the hospital also needs to be addressed 
adequately in, in something that staff feels comfortable um, in a development agreement. Um, so I wink, wink, nudge to transportation staff um, if you're interested in having that conversation. Um, but there are still few outstanding um, application items. I doubt you want me to bore you with. Um, we're, we're working on them now. I think yeah, Tim, they did a great job of outlining them for us. Um, we, we've been, um, the, some of the teams in the room right now, we've been diligently working on them since her last list. We feel confident that we can get that list kicked off and over to her in the time frame that she's given us. It's where we are really, we're, we're getting towards that place of dealing with mitigation and development agreement. And this schedule that's proposed means that um, we have to be more open to a fluid process, meaning um, we'll be at Planning and Zoning Commission trying to explain uh, where, all, where and how all of these conversations have happened, how this is moving forward, um, because we may not have all of those details. I mean, I expect that this development agreement is going to continue through the negotiation process while we go through that public hearing process, um, and that will be interesting. So we'll put our best effort out. It will be a fluid process. It will be unique and different. I think that's where the synergy and transparency component that Council and Salas um, brings up, that's where that comes into play, right? I think we we are we are community partners to you. We are not real estate developers who are here to try and develop something for profit. We're developing. There is no profit here for us from a real estate development perspective. This is development that is community focused, health focused. Um, so I think um, if there's a time to, to dabble in fluidity and, and transparency and synergy, I think we're the right partner for the city to do that with. And I think when you look at overall the, the scale of a project like this, um, regardless if it was us or a uh, for-profit developer doing something different, that that's, that's what a development of this scale um, and scope takes. It, it's very difficult to check all the boxes. Um, and there is some trust component, some fluidity component that I think has to play into the process. So that leads me to a question, Vice Mayor. Um, all right, so I, I see a path forward here um, for the end of the day. Uh, I, I, I do wonder how fragile this timeline is, irrespective of the fact that we're taking the next steps right now. Uh, I suppose it could drag on and fall apart at any one of those various stages or dates. I, that's my uh, spidey sense on that. Um, and I, I just want to articulate it. Um, I, I think it's great to shoot for this, and I have no problem getting it done efficiently and quickly if we're able to. Yeah. Um, but the, I, I just don't want it hanging out there unsaid that this is this means everything's going to finish yeah. by but, December 30th. Agree. I appreciate you saying that out loud, uh, Councilor Stanson. I think we're knowledgeable of that fact, right? But I think we also feel like if we don't leave today with a goal, then we're not getting anywhere, right? Everyone said at the beginning, clarity, path forward, right? This is a path forward. Yeah, if, if, if we don't hit it to the date, I understand that. And I do understand the ramifications and implications of flipping up to new council. It's not what we desire. But I think if we don't set forth a path that we all agree on that is a goal, we're never really even going to get started. So what we're asking for is agreement from city staff, city council, and, and us giving you our kind of public acknowledgement that we are on board to try and meet this deadline. If things get in the way of it. I, I understand that process, but I still think it gets us in the process and it starts us moving forward as opposed to the last 20 months of just kind of volleying the ball back and forth over the net. Um, so I still think it's a, a realistic uh, goal for us to set for ourselves and understanding that it might not be met. So I want to jump in for a second. So look at all this incredible information sharing, curiosity, a desire to move forward together. With our remaining 18 minutes until 4.30, right? I want to see if there are any other, if there's any other information sharing that wants to happen. Any other questions? We see um, Councilmember Salas and Steve, you alluded to Whitney talking earlier. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? So you may, <laughs> if you want the opportunity. And then the idea is to, um, I'll turn it over to Vice, Vice Mayor Sweet. But I just want us to get kind of laser focused now with any questions or comments or um, information shares. Yes? Yeah? Council Member Salas. 
So information sharing is with my role on the Metro Plan and um, RTAC as Vice Chair of the Rural Transportation and Fiscal Council. Uh, I took advantage of the opportunity to speak one on one with Director Haligowski of ADOT and um, our Federal Transit Administrator for Region 9. And I apologize, I'm black. It's not me, Mr. Ray, um, about the opportunity that's um, that's uh, rising in Flagstaff about, it's not just about the hospital relocating, but it's the development of a health and wellness village. And again, I challenge um, uh, ADOT and our FTA administrator, this is an opportunity to synergize with the hospital in terms of transportation infrastructure and transit services. We would love that. Um, days are focused here. Back to the timeline. Thank you for the discussion. One scenario that could very well play out here is that this process occurs with a changing council. In other words, it starts with the existing council and finishes with the council to be seated on December 20th. I don't think that's a very unrealistic possibility. We have uh, three incumbents running uh, to, to be reelected. Uh, so another uh, possibility, not at all trying to, you know, predict outcomes of, of November, but a possibility would be that you don't have significant change uh, with the next council. Um, and with that in mind, my my very focused question is, you know, if, if you're coming away from this with an outcome that I, that I think you're hearing, which is we will expedite to the extent we we're able to. Yeah. But knowing that it might not come to finality with the current council, how much of, of a deal is that for the NAH team? I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, obviously, this is the, the timeline we would prefer, but I think we feel we're at a point where we need to make a path forward and we need to get started in that process. Um, we feel that we have a very well thought out development and a very strong case that regardless of the council members who are healing it, although we would love for it to be this council um, with all the input they've given us over the last two years, that we have um, a project that we're putting forward that is just brimming with community benefit. Um, so we understand that that is that could potentially happen. We also understand that if we wait three more months to start the process that we could be in front of a different council. So, you know, I think we, we, we guarantee ourselves a different council if we don't start on this process. And in this case, we have an opportunity that it might happen. Um, we're accepting of that um, and think that the more important focus for us is to get the process started um, to, to get, we, we showed a, a pretty good outline today of what we're dealing with from a community perspective and the deferrals we have, that number is only gonna increase as our growth in the region increases. This isn't just Flagstaff growth, this is regional growth. It's gonna play into that, that deferral number. So we're only gonna to continue to see increases in deferrals. We're only gonna to continue to see um, increases in either patient or staff dissatisfaction from current working environments. Um, so we still see the light at the end of the tunnel that this project is the right thing to do for the city and the region um, and feel we have a strong case uh, with whoever we speak to about it. Thank you. Could I, could I add to that? Can they put a little different focus on it? Um, what Chief Guard was telling us, I think, helps sharpen this a little bit, because for, for staff to bring this application forward, they need to hear from their constituencies, yeah, we think we have a plan and how we don't. And what you hear Chief Guard say is, if NAH is bringing money to the table from economic development, NAH is willing to help its, you know, bridge its gap, but it, it can't fund the pre-existing issues and of course, Chief Geyer can't solve for those. That that has to be this body. But if that is preventing him from giving a green light to Tiffany and her team, then then we're stuck. And the the traffic impact analysis is another good example. I and mean, this is literally a, a document, thousands of pages long, right? And Jeff Bauman and Stephanie Santana work really hard to get through it. But if but if but if, if what they're asked to do is make sure that we know every mitigation that needs to be implemented over the next 20 years in the radius that's being studied, that we, we could be at that for a long, long time, right? 
But if, as Tiffany has proposed, we take a narrower view of the project, get the hospital approved, and that is even if some, as I said when I talked, some, some remaining T's need to be crossed and I's need to be dotted on, on a bigger traffic impact analysis, we all know what the mitigation probably needs to be for the initial hospital and ambulatory care facility. But the traffic folks need to have that path so that they can give the green light to Tiffany, right? So that those applications then can come to the council. Again, these are policy decisions and these are paths forward that can be put into a development agreement. Christina's really good at that. Um, and so that, I think that's the, where we need to go forward. Transit is the same. We know that Mountain Line ultimately needs to be providing public transit to this project. We also know that we're not gonna solve that problem in 2022. Might we solve it by 2027? Maybe. Would we solve it by 2030? I don't think without question. But so in other words, that development agreement allows us to agree to continue working together with hooks by the city in the project to get there, um, as opposed to asking your traffic engineers to, to solve the big problem or asking Chief Geyer to solve the budget problem. That, that's really why we're here today is because is we want, we need council to be able to say, bring us the project and then we can work together to solve what NAH can't solve on its own. And continue to grow and evolve and adapt with what's going to happen between now and 2027, right? There could be hundreds of acres of residential that gets developed between now and 2027. There's going to be only road alignments that could be either underway or in place by 2027. So um, just like um, City Manager Clifton said, we have years to figure out the fire department. We're working on it. We know we need to get there. We're, we're, we're saying the same thing. We know we need to get there. Um, but it feels like sometimes we're being asked to definitively say what we're willing to do five years from now when we don't know what we need to do or the community even needs from us five years from now. But it seems acceptable for the city to be able to say, well, we're working on that. We'll have a plan by the time we get there. We're, we'll, we're saying the exact same thing. And we're saying that we're willing to put it in writing from a development agreement standpoint, or just you can bring this video tape back up in five years and point at me. Um, we're, we're saying the same thing. We're saying that we want to enter into this agreement that's going to be an evolving process. It's going to be synergistic. It's going to be community focused and that we want to be your partner moving forward. And that the only way to even start that partnership moving forward is to start this process. Uh, final clarifying point. Um, so I'm just really excited. I feel like we're figuring out a path forward here, and uh, that's huge. Uh, there are going to be other hurdles to this project, but I'm uh, buttressed by hope uh, with how things turned out today that we can continue putting one foot in front of the other and, and making these opportunities um, happen for our community. Uh, I wanted to give a second voice to uh, Councilmember Shimoni's um, call out for uh, a net zero functionality. I don't know that that's um, likely or plausible for you guys. If, if you were planning on doing this operation as net zero, you'd be touting it uh, all the way up and down loudly already at this point. And I'm sure there are significant challenges to, um, you know, getting certified or whatever as a net zero uh, facility. Yeah. Um, but I want to give a second voice to Councilmember Shimoni's challenge there um, that we go as far as we can with that um, and we put it in writing as much as we can. And then likewise, I would ask Council to uh, back up my desire that we make sure that there's dark sky compliance uh, and that there's buy-in from the Naval Observatory at, at the end of the day um, for whatever construction moves forward. Uh, it'd be nice to have a majority of council state out loud that there uh, that there's direction there. Um, but otherwise, that's all I have for right now. And thank you very much. And Councilman, if it's okay with you, if I could get a couple of days to work with my engineering team, maybe we could put something together that we could send to all council and staff that they better clarifies what our current plan is. You're right, net zero for a hospital is very difficult. There's 
numerous reasons that we don't have to bog this meeting down with um, from regulatory to, to other things. Um, and, and I understand what Councilman Chimone was talking about, about a hospital in Oakland, but I'm sure there's a backstory there that doesn't quite paint the picture as easily um, as just saying, well, net zero hospitals exist and we can start replicating them. So if it's okay with you to give us a week or so, we can put something together that's maybe a little bit more approachable for council and we can send that into you so we're perfectly clear with our intentions prior to you talking to us again. So in terms of this issue, the community has asked for transparency and you've just demonstrated it so beautifully today. The curiosity, the honesty, the willing to bring the real issues to the table is really refreshing, quite frankly, and inspiring. The other thing is that once you leave this room today, we want to talk about what uh, communication um, either schedule or the, the collaboration could look like, whether that's work sessions together or that's retreats together, like this to be able to have open discussions like this. So I just want to put that on the table. Vice Mayor. So I am wondering, staff, do you have clear direction from us today on the next meeting? Or do we need to do a roll call? So we can... You need thumbs up, thumbs up. Parts. Can I ask a question on direction? And, and I don't know if you have the same question, um, Tiffany. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that in order to meet the schedule, we have to start noticing before we're going to have some of the impact analyses complete, at least with respect for the fire. Um, and so just wanting to, I, I just want to be clear that council is okay with starting the public hearing process before we have the impact analysis complete understanding that before it gets to council it'll be complete but not with those three um hearings before the planning and zoning commission and thank you for that. and just to clarify with that said everything christine says absolutely 100 percent correct but just um for context we like I said earlier, facets is in the room. We have them under contract. The work is underway. Um, so we feel very confident that we're going to have a work product to you um, when we when we get to that process. But what we are asking is for the entire process to not be held up while we're doing that body of work that we've already committed to. So can I get a thumbs up or a heads nod? Councilmember Shimoni? Thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Any other comments? Do you? It, it just follows along the same line. The development agreement will be, you know, in the negotiation process as we move through. We might not have that fully vetted while we're in the planning and zoning commission public hearing. So it's the same issue. But again, they have to be able to make the findings and make a recommendation. And so I think the applicant is well aware of what the risks are. Great. And I see Council Member Shimoni has a comment. Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to thank again Steve and the team um, for this conversation. I think this was really productive and helpful, and I do feel like we are taking steps forward. And I just wanted to also voice support for what Council Member Aslan was bringing up about the Naval Observatory and dark skies. I, Steve, I, I like to think that you are right there with us with that goal, and we'll 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 meet that that desire. But I uh, just wanted to vo vo verbalize that support. But thank you all for the time today and the discussion and uh, working with us to make this the best project for our community. We're we're excited about it. Thank you, Councilman Schumer. And I'll make the same offer on the dark skies piece as I did on the the net zero piece. We'll I'll, I'll get with our engineers and put something together so you understand what our intent is. Um, we, we do intend on meeting the dark skies ordinances. We do. We we are a, a level one trauma center emergency department. We do have some oddities to the, what we do from a business perspective that some others don't. We have to keep kind of safety and security um, at, at the forefront, but we will we will draft something in short order um, with our intent. We'll have a third. Do we need to third direction. <laughs> Sorry. Vice Mayor Sweet did two thumbs, so. <laughs> <laughs> we asked seven thumbs. <laughs> and we only have six. Well, we have five. Yeah. Sorry, Julie's asking about public comment. We don't want to curtail this discussion, but it would be good to open up, up public comment while we have the NAH team in the room. And I think there are some folks in the hallway, so. There's the 
Thank you. Thank you. That's over to us today. I know that I've got two members of the public in our virtual room, so I've asked for them to indicate if they want to speak ahead of her. Did you get there? So while we're getting ready for public comment, will you just take a moment? Everybody in the room, turn to your neighbor and either high five, fist bump, elbow, something like that for the amazing collaboration that was just demonstrated here. All right, let's come on back and it is public comment time. What's Betsy Salzberg? All right, so I do have one online commenter right now, so I'm going to go ahead and um, turn the time over to Michelle James. Michelle, you'll have three minutes to offer your comments. Um, if you want to, oh, I've got to, oh, I've got to allow her to do that. <laughs> Sorry. Can I help Stacy? No, I, I'm here. Apologies. All right, Michelle, you should be able to unmute now and turn your camera on if you'd like and give your comments. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Vice Mayor and Council, I, uh, I appreciate that you um, made this public and, and discussed all this in your retreat today. I learned a lot about some issues. Um, here's what I'd like to say is I'm, the, I'm Michelle James. I'm the Vice President, um, excuse me, the Executive Director of Friends of Flagstaff's Future. And um, what I'd like to do is summarize FCUBE's concerns. You guys have talked a lot about today, a lot about fire, traffic, and um, sustainable housing and or attainable housing. And I think those things are very, very important. That some of the things that F-Cubed is concerned about, and this probably won't be a surprise to many of you, is we feel like we need specific details. The community needs specific details um, and written commitments from NAH regarding public transportation, collaborating with Mountain Line, um, a written agreement with details so that a fixed fixed route line um, when is in place when the hospital opens. Um, we need to hear how NEH is going to, um, to try to achieve the climate neutrality plan. And I don't think saying best efforts is good enough. Um, and we also need a commitment to creating a plan with community, with a rigorous community process to redevelop the existing campus and nearby properties. Um, F cubed has, has felt as feeling that until these details and commitment are received, NEH is not ready to go through with the rezoning process. Thank you. It looks like I've got three members of the public that want to speak, and I am sorry if I get your names wrong, but I have Dustin Wendell. Excellent. If you want to come on up to the front, that way we can be sure that everyone can hear you. At least the podium's clear. <laughs> yeah. Is there a mic or anything? No. Just, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm Dustin Wendell. I'm the program director for Guardian Air. We have eight air medical bases throughout northern Arizona. Uh, you guys see the red, white, and blue helicopters flying around that house. Um, I just wanted to say a couple words about the campus and how it'll impact our service. So we very frequently have to fly patients from all over northern Arizona, not just Flagstaff, but the reservation, White Mountains, uh, Kingman area, all the way to Phoenix uh, because we don't have services here. 
So although NIH is an amazing hospital, it's the only level one trauma center in Northern Arizona. So we're the only level one center north of Phoenix. Um, and so, for example, in the Navajo Nation, if we pick somebody up in Chinle or Tuba City, we have to fly them down to Phoenix because we don't have bed capacity here, um, or we can't attract the right services here sometimes because of our facilities. Um, the the impact to the families is is near catastrophic. So if, if you've got you know grandma is at Banner Baywood or something down in the valley, um, the the family often can't travel. They may be sharing one car, uh, four hours one way, without a place to stay, things like that. And then you add to the <clears throat> added added to that for the Navajo Nation and the Hopi Nation is the cultural awareness and sensitivities that our hospital and Flagstaff has that a lot of the valley hospitals don't have. So um, advocating for those populations uh, is, is important to me, but beyond that, the sooner we're able to transfer a patient from a smaller hospital or community to definitive care, hopefully in Flagstaff, the sooner we're back in service, which makes us available for the next trauma, the next cardiac event, the next stroke. Um, so just all the way around, uh, having availability here in town uh, improves the care for the, for the greater Northern Arizona, not just Flagstaff. Um, Beyond that, uh, we uh, we're just we're just grateful to to be a part of the community. I don't really have anything else. We have a question about air transport. Uh, is there going to be any conflict between your flight paths, flight paths at the very nearby airport? No, sir. So we're we actually are based at the airport now. Our our Flagstaff base is at the airport. Our uh, administrative office, my office, is all there at the airport. Uh, so all the aircraft will drop in at FMC and then go to the airport for fuel. So we already have a, a pretty large portion of our traffic going that direction. If anything, it, it improves our efficiency a little bit. So in the summer times, we often have performance issues with the aircraft. And we have to shuttle patients by ground from the airport to the hospital or vice versa because we don't have the performance to lift off of the helipad in the heat of the summer. That's a whole physics thing you get into at some point, but um, that'll that'll make that trip super short. So there's there's some uh, sometimes we're transferring through traffic and it might take 20 plus minutes to get to the hospital. That'll go down to you know one or two. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, our next commenter is Mark Russett. Tacit. Tacit. Sorry. <laughs> Doctor Mark Tacit. While he's coming up, for the record, uh, Austin Aslan is still here, uh, even though he's not at the table. Okay. Good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak in support of the Northern Arizona Healthcare um, Health and Wellness Village. My name is Mark Tassa. I'm one of the uh, cardiothoracic surgeons um, up here, and I've been practicing up here for about 12 years. The uh, so. I want to imagine a scenario you or a loved one has a major surgery or is in the hospital for a, a major illness that requires a hospitalization. Um, being in the hospital, as many people who have been in the hospital can appreciate, is uh, uncomfortable and pretty much your, your stay is riddled with uh, interruptions and your rest and it's hard to sleep. Much of this is unavoidable and it's necessary as part of normal nursing duties, but now throw in there, toss in there a roommate. Um, the patient with their own problems and that are going to have their own interruptions and that person happens to be four feet away from you. Uh, to rest in low levels of stress are important to anybody getting over a major illness or a surgery. And people can say, you know, I'm okay with having a roommate and everybody's okay with a roommate until, they, they're, the one in the, until they're the one in the bed. And then you have everybody asking for their own private rooms. And unfortunately, the current hospital situation doesn't afford this doesn't afford private rooms, and most of the room, most people are doubled up in rooms in the current hospital. Um, Flagstaff Medical Center saw its first patient in 1936, and since that time, the hospital's been growing. It's been expanding services, and it's been doing so in effort to better care for the population of Northern Arizona. Um, this needs to continue. The things, uh, treatments are getting more complicated. We need more equipment. We need, um, and we need to. Uh, be able to expand the footprint of the hospital. Unfortunately, the current location doesn't allow that. Um, I believe that the proposed uh, Northern Arizona Health and Wellness Village is necessary for multiple reasons. One is for what I mentioned before, where patients can convalesce in, in what should be um, reasonable privacy. Um, the second is to consider that the medical field is 
of constantly changing. We have some great providers in our hospital now, but these people aren't going to be there forever. So people are going to retire. They're going to move on. You need to have an, an institution that's going to attract talent in medicine and nursing, nursing and physicians, physician talent, so that they are going to even want to come here. People don't want to come to a hospital that's overcrowded, doesn't have any space for equipment, and doesn't doesn't have any way to grow or expand expand services. So um, I hope that that's kind of my take on this as a physician, somebody who's been in the hospital for a long time and happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kasper. Thank you. 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 This is why they don't give me the job all the time of calling the names. <laughs> Hello, thank you for having me this evening. Uh, my name is Jeannie Wiles. I am currently the clinical manager in our special care nursery up here at the hospital. And I wanted to speak from the perspective of our families, our babies, and our children. Um, currently in our NICU right now, we do not have private rooms. So their babies are out in the open. They have a curtain. So if parents want privacy with their babies, we pull that curtain around them. And because we are so close in space, they go home at night. So they don't get to stay with their babies, their critically ill babies or their premature babies at night 24 seven. So they're leaving their babies, praying that we are giving the care that we are trained to give. And um, this new hospital, the, the plans that we have, I'm so thrilled about because they have private rooms for every patient, space that we can allow parents to have space and stay with their babies when they're here with us. And what we're seeing in so much research and other hospitals that have created spaces for families to be at the bedside is that babies are healing faster, they're growing better, they're being discharged from the hospital sooner, so they're going home with their families. We're seeing babies, um, their outcomes are just in general a lot better, but we're seeing families feel more comfortable taking home a premature baby, taking home a small baby who has a feeding tube or hasn't been feeding well for the past three months. We typically see premature babies in our unit stay for up to five months. And so it's a really long time to be separated from your family. And right now, because we're the only NICU in Northern Arizona, we have families come to us from Kingman and out on the reservation in Chin Lee and, and even up from South and Cottonwood. So they're spending a ton of money trying to stay locally with their baby and we don't have the facility for them to be there. Um, a, a benefit and a beautiful thing of being able to be in the room with your babies as parents will be learning how to take care of their babies while they're here with us. And so they feel much more competent going home, taking care of their babies rather than, oh, hey, you're gonna get to go home and be discharged today. And I'm going to teach you everything you need to know right now. And then we're sending you out the door because we need your bed because we don't have enough beds in our in our hospital for, for all of our patients at times. And so having a space for everybody will, will be a huge blessing. And not only in our um, NICU world, but for our pediatric patient population right now, we only have um, 14 beds for pediatric patients in our current hospital. And so when our hospital gets full, our pediatric unit gets full, especially in the winter time when it's high season, kids are sharing germs and we see a lot of um, pediatric admissions, we separate children from their family again and we send them south because we don't have places for them to stay. So support services, parents, siblings are here, and then we have to fly a baby or a, a child or a 15 year old, and then mom or dad maybe drives down, hopefully maybe, and has a place to stay in Phoenix. So having a, uh, a new facility with room to grow, room to expand, room to support that family unit and that bonding would be huge. I think that's my time probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I did get another request in Heather Domlin. Thank you. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Heather Domlin and the uh, CEO for Mountain Line Transit. And I just wanted to take a few moments and thank uh, City Manager Clifton, City staff in Northern Arizona Healthcare. We've been a participant in many conversations about the need for transit at this location. I'll just give you a couple of facts and figures. 70% of our riders are transit dependent. That means they don't have a car, they don't have the choice of driving to any location. 
We currently serve about 80 employees that work at Northern Arizona Healthcare at their current location, and they contribute about 12,000 trips per year to our service. Additionally, the stops at the hospital are the ninth highest used stops on our system with an additional 23,000 trips by visitors to the hospital, people visiting patients, or maybe even patients themselves. We have transported more than one patient that has been discharged from the hospital home or to their next destination. So we look forward to continuing the conversations about how transit is a part of that plan as more than Arizona healthcare looks at their new location. Thank you. I'm going to give just one quick. Anybody else would like to speak? I'm not seeing anybody else online. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. What an incredible afternoon. Yes? Yes. yes. Clearly, this is important to the community. Way to turn out. It's great to see everybody. So the question now is in terms of continued conversation and communication, would it be possible to take two minutes to discuss what next steps are in terms of communicating at a table again like this might look like? What would what would be desired? I would do this every day. <laughs> every day. Every day. Um, I, I don't I don't know how you feel. I mean, like like I we said earlier, I mean I think we're we're Committed to this to this fluid approach, we're, we're not looking to get off the hook for anything. Um, we're looking to get the process started. Um, Tiffany and her team have been unbelievably transparent. With um, you know, we talked about I talked about clarity uh, earlier. Well, if you've ever done business with Tiffany, clarity is what you're going to get. She can <laughs> tell you exactly what she needs and when she needs it by. And so we, you know, which we which we appreciate. So we're working towards towards meeting that goal for her. Um, and and all we're asking moving forward is discussion like this when we hit the roadblock instead of a series of word document comments that we sit on for two weeks. And I think um, I I feel confident that between us and the city from a partnership perspective that we can be in front of council on December 6th if the schedule holds and that we can have answers to some of the questions that came up today. I think we displayed um, that we're willing participants in this process and I think we also kind of broke through um, the a, a little bit of a wall we had that a lot of the issues that are perceived to be NIH issues on this project are actually kind of shared issues between us and the city and without both of us um, participating in the process it doesn't matter what we commit to. Um, we have to come together to meet our intended goals. And I think um, today is the first time I really felt like everyone is committed to partnering through that process. So I appreciate everyone's time today. I would just add from a, a public and transparency um, position that when you look at that calendar, several of those dates, actually about five of them, are public hearings. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity for this group to come back together and have conversations about this with being open to the public. So great. Okay. So with that, yeah, it's gonna be gavel time in just in just a moment. But before we do that, I would like to offer um senior manager Clifton the opportunity to round us out, wrap us up, anything you might like to share in, in terms of appreciation of what has happened here today or comments, um, takeaways from your perspective. Yeah, thanks. Great retreat. Um, for the benefit of those who are not here this morning, we've been at this table since about 8.30. The first half of the day was allocated entirely to infrastructure. We talked about wastewater improvements that are needed very similar to the discussion about fire, just a different utility. Uh, we talked about flood response. Don't have to impress upon you the importance of that. Um, and, and other things involving public safety, uh, involving you know things that have occurred over the last 12 months, which in this community have, have been rather remarkable in, in terms of scope and, and uh, significance. Um, to segue into the discussion that occurred this afternoon is very, cool to say the least because we've been looking behind uh, over the last 12 months talking a little bit about what lies ahead this afternoon we're talking about what lies ahead uh, and that is uh, that is the business of the city right that's the business of all of you uh, I want to thank our many guests in the room it's unusual to have 
uh, a turnout in a retreat like this. Usually our retreats, quite frankly, don't draw a big crowd because um, usually it's about budget stuff. Um, this is very special to us. I, I think perhaps it's a template that should be replicated in the future as we have these very important topics that everybody wants to hear. I want to thank the council for your engagement. I especially want to thank staff for the preparation, framing the meeting, the NAH team for coming to the table and rolling up your sleeves and getting into some pretty important dialogue with us. Thank you for that. Lastly, I want to thank you, Julie Lancaster, for facilitating a great retreat as always. It's good to have you here. And I know we went a little bit over, but I think it was well worth it. So thank you. Great. Thank you. At that meeting, 